You know, people say evolution is not a bad philosophy, but at the same time, it was Hitler's religion during the Third Reich in Germany. Hi, my name is Eric. In this next seminar, Dr. Hoven exposes some of the terrible things that have been done in the name of evolution. Because dictators throughout time have used the evolutionary ideas to support their brutal tactics. I taught high school science for 15 years, and now for 14 years I've been an evangelist traveling and doing seminars on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. And tonight we're going to share with you some of the dangers of this evolution theory. I don't leave my gorgeous wife and travel every week of the year because I like being gone. <laughs> Folks, this is an, evolution is not just a dumb idea, it's a very dangerous philosophy. I've only got three things I want to cover, but it's probably going to take several nights to do that. First of all, I want to tell you what on earth is happening. And secondly, why is the evolution theory dangerous, and what do you do about it? Pretty simple. Okay, what is happening? Tonight, as I speak, our president is announcing we're about to go blow up Iraq, I believe, right? The world seems to be coming unglued at the seams. There are wars and rumors of wars every place we look. Why on earth would Joseph Stalin order the execution of 14,700 Polish prisoner of war officers? I thought there was a Geneva Convention. Why do you order the execution of prisoners of war? Why did Hitler order the execution of nearly six million Jews plus others? Why did Paul Pott, later in the Cam Cambodian Khmer Rouge, order the execution of one-third to one-half of his entire population, his own people? He killed them. Why? Why would somebody do that? Why would the Australian Aborigines be rounded up like cows and shot so their heads could be put in museums years ago? Why would somebody do that? Why did Kip Kinkle murder his parents, two other classmates, and shoot 26 other ones? Why would a student do that? Kip said, if there was a God, he wouldn't let me feel the way I do. There is no God, only hate. On May 21st, 1998, 15-year-old Kip Kinkle, a student at Thurston High School, that's in Oregon, near Eugene, allegedly entered the school cafeteria and fired more than 50 rounds from a semi-automatic rifle. 26 students were injured. Two killed. Later, the bodies of his parents were found in his home. He was then arrested and taken to a police headquarters where he attempted to murder a detective during his questioning. Kip said, if there was a God, he wouldn't let me feel the way I do. There's no God, only hate. Why have we had a nearly a 1,000% increase in violent crimes since I was a boy? I remember the days when you did not have to lock your house. We'd go off on vacation for two weeks. Wouldn't even, I, I never had a key to my house growing up. Never did have a key. I don't know if it even had one. You didn't need one in those days. Why would there be such a horrendous increase in unwed birth rates and so much of our moral structure is just simply unraveling? What on earth is happening? Dylan and uh, Eric, Her Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold made a videotape prior to the Columbine shootings. On that tape, they said, talking about one of the football players, he doesn't deserve the jaw evolution gave him. Look for his jaw. It won't be on his body. Hmm. Those, these two boys were very strong believers in evolution. They did the shooting on Hitler's birthday on purpose. They shot Isaiah Scholes just simply because he was black. They shot Cassie just because she believed in God. Same thing with Rachel. What happened? Why, why would somebody do this? What's going on in our thinking? Well, the newspaper article in Columbine High School said, the clothes may give a clue to the thinking of these teenagers. The autopsy said one of the boys' shirts said natural selection on the front. Interesting. Textbooks used in Escambia County, Florida, this textbook, says evolution and natural selection go together. Hmm. This textbook says natural selection causes evolution. Well, just what is this natural selection? Oh, you see, Adolf Hitler thought he would speed up the process by eliminating the inferiors. Hitler honestly thought he was doing the world a favor. So did Joseph Stalin. So did Paul Pott. Why do people do these things? So what is wrong with our thinking? Right after the Columbine shooting, almost instantaneously, five more students from within the Springfield School District were arrested for threatening to murder students. 
principals, or teachers. In the adjacent school districts, more students were arrested for violent threats, and in one case, an elementary schoolboy shot five of his classmates with a BB gun. Could it possibly be that what we're teaching them is causing this behavior? You know, what you believe determines how you behave. If you're raised up in a head-hunting society, and you're taught from the time you're a boy, if you go off to war and shoot somebody, you ought to kill him and cut off his head and uh, eat the brains because you get his spirit. I mean, if you really believe that, guess what you're going to do when you go off to war? <laughs> you're gonna, you, you, your behavior is determined by your beliefs. What you believe determines how you behave. It's always been that way, and it's no different today. Could it be that this evolution theory is to blame? This textbook says, you're an animal and share a common heritage with earthworms. Question. If evolution is true, how are the kids supposed to tell right from wrong? I spoke in a public school in Pennsylvania one time. A kid sat on the second row and he said, Mr. Hovind, I'm an atheist. I said, really? He said, yep, there is no God. I said, well, tell me, son, are you sure? He said, yep, I'm sure. I said, well, son, do you know everything? He said, no. I said, do you know maybe half of everything? He said, no. I said, okay, well, let's just pretend that you know half of everything. Is it possible that God exists in the other half you don't know? Brand new thought rattled around in his brain for a while and got lost, I believe. I said, by the way, son, if there's no God, how do you tell right from wrong? He said, oh, that's easy. He said, I determine what's right and wrong. He said, I'm the God of my own universe. I said, I'm glad to hear about that, son, because I'm going to shoot you in five minutes. He said, you can't do that. I said, oh, yeah, I can. You see, I'm the God of my own universe. And I decided it's fine for me to shoot you. Question, exactly how do we tell right from wrong? In the first couple of seminar tapes, we talked about a variety of topics like the Big Bang Theory, how it's a big dud. We talked about the Garden of Eden and we talked about why the earth cannot be billions of years old and why did the people live to be 900 years old before the big flood came. We talked about dinosaurs and students are being lied to about dinosaurs. They did not live millions of years ago. And on tape number four, we talk about a whole bunch of lies in the textbooks. Now here we're going to talk about what's happened in the last 150 years since evolution became a popular theory. What on earth is happening? And what you can do about it? We'll get to that eventually. We're going to review some of what we covered on tape number four, some of the lies in the textbooks, and then go on into how it carries into some practical steps we can take. What do you do about it? We covered in the last sessions how that James Hutton wrote a book in 1795, and he said the earth is millions of years old. Now during the late 1700s, most folks believed the Bible, and most folks thought the earth was about 6,000 years old, because if you add up the dates in the Bible, you're going to get about uh, 6,000. 4,000 B.C., not millions. So James Hutton came along and caused people to doubt the earth was 6,000 years old. Then his book had a very strong influence on a lawyer from Scotland named Charles Lyell. Charles Lyell wrote a book in 1830, and in his book he developed what we call today the geologic column. Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic, and you know, maybe you saw the movie Jurassic Park named after the Jurassic layer. This whole thing was made up by Charles Lyell in 1830, and the geologic column does not exist any place in the world except in the textbooks. It's pure imagination. It doesn't exist. But all of evolution theory is based on that dumb geologic column made up in 1830. This fellow said, I myself have little doubt that in England it was the long age uniformitarian geology and the theory of evolution that changed us from a Christian to a pagan nation. He's right about that. And England is a pagan nation. And folks, I don't know if America ever was a Christian country or not, but it's not now. We are a pagan nation also. What has happened? Charles Lyell's book had a very strong influence on a young preacher named Charles Darwin. Darwin graduated from Bible college to be a preacher. In 1859, after 22 years of writing, Darwin finally published his book, The Origin of Species. We'll get into more of that later, the real title to the book. Darwin's philosophy was strongly influenced by people like Charles Lyell, people like Thomas Malthus. Malthus had written a book that said, there are more babies born than can possibly survive, so it's best if the weakest die off. That greatly influenced people like Charles Dickens when he wrote the Christmas Carol. Remember the scene in there where Scrooge said, well, if he's going to die, let him die, then and decrease the surplus population. Remember that line in there? You can, I don't think you can understand the Christmas Carol, the history behind that, until you understand how evolution ties in. James Hutton's book made people doubt the earth was 6,000 years old. Along came Charlie Lyell, and people began to doubt the flood. 
Because instead of the flood making all those layers, they said, oh, maybe each layer is a different age. And then along came Charlie Darwin, and people began to doubt the Creator. And so by the mid-1800s, the Western world, at least, was left with in, a, in a bad situation. They said, well, if there's no God, who's in charge? Well, it uh, must be us. This led directly to the rise of humanism. Humanism is the teaching that there is no God, so we must be God. We make the rules. We decide what's right and wrong. For the next 50 years, after Darwin's book came out, many isms arose in the world. Marxism, Nazism, Communism. These things, Communism would have been just a footnote in a history book if it hadn't been for evolution coming along at the right time. We never would have heard of Communism. Most of us wouldn't. If it hadn't been for Charles Darwin coming along and giving justification to that dumb idea of Communism. Hoyle said, I am haunted by a conviction that the nihilistic philosophy, which so-called educated opinion chose to adapt, adopt following the publication of The Origin of Species, committed mankind to a course of automatic self-destruction. A doomsday was then set ticking. I agree, Fred. Once you start believing there's no God and we're in charge, then we're in trouble. There was a Russian atheist astronomer who came to America one time, and he spoke at one of the universities, and he said, now folks, either there is a God or there isn't. I thought, boy, this guy's brilliant. <laughs> but then he said, both possibilities are frightening. I thought, wow, oh, that is brilliant. You see, if there is a God, we better find out who He is and find out what He wants and do what He says. Amen. If there is no God, we're in trouble because we're hurtling through space at 66,000 miles an hour and nobody's in charge. Pretty scary thought. Charles Darwin said, often, a cold shudder has run through me as I have asked myself whether I may have devoted myself to a fantasy. Well, Charlie, you did devote yourself to a fantasy. If you believe you came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago, you need help. You were designed for a purpose. Now, what is it? There are four great questions that every single religion in the world tries to answer. Even atheism, which is a religion, you have to believe there is no God. There's no way to know that. The four great questions every religion tries to answer. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going when I die? The way you answer these questions depends upon how you view the world. There are basically only two ways to look at this world. One view says, you know, there's incredible design. There must be a designer. That's the creationist worldview. Other people look at the world and say, you know, nobody made it. It just made itself. They don't believe God created the heaven and the earth. They think a big bang made this world from nothing. That's called the humanist worldview. It just made itself. The first plank in the Humanist Manifesto in 1933 was, the universe is self-created, self-existing, and not created. That's the first thing they have to agree to, to be a humanist. There's now been Humanist Manifesto 2 in 1973 and Humanist Mas Manifesto 3 in the year 2000. They have to declare what they believe. Humanism is a religion. You have to believe there is no God. So why is this theory dangerous? Evolution, I am convinced after studying this now for 30-some years, Evolution is absolutely the foundation for communism, Marxism, Nazism, socialism, racism. We'll get into some more of that in a minute. Number one, I think evolution is dangerous because it's bad science based on lies. There is no scientific evidence to back up this evolution theory. We've been offering $250,000 for a long time at our ministry for somebody who could give us some real scientific evidence for evolution. It is funny, brother, to see the people try to turn stuff in. One guy said, I've got proof for evolution. I said, really, what do you have? He said, well, I'm working in the laboratory right now, and we have developed soybean plants that are resistant to frost. I said, man, that's good. That'll really be handy. I said, what did you start with? He said, well, um, soybean plants. I said, oh, what do you have now? He said, I've got a whole new species. I said, of what? Of a uh, soybean plant. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, sir. That's not evolution, okay? That's a variety of a soybean plant. And it's interesting, and I'm glad you're able to do that. But that's not evolution. There is no evidence whatsoever that any animal ever produced a different kind of animal. So why would anybody believe such a dumb idea? And how can this be so dangerous? Well, we'll cover some of the isms in just a minute. But evolution is based on lies and bad science. There is no good science to back it up. This textbook says, evolution is a fact. Evolution is a fact, not theory. Birds arose from non-birds and humans from non-humans. No person who pretends to any understanding of the natural world can deny these facts any more than she or he can deny that the earth is round, rotates on its axis, and revolves around the sun. Sounds like he's open-minded for a discussion, doesn't it? 
This is not a fact, folks. Evolution is a mantra. They say this over and over and over, hoping it will become true. It's, not, it's all it is. They just keep repeating it. Oh, hope, evolution's a fact, it's a fact, it's a fact. Well, you better de define what you're talking about with evolution. We do that on videotape number four, the six different meanings of this word evolution. This textbook says evolution has evidence from fossils, from structure, from molecular biology, from development. Any evidence that's used to support evolution has been proven wrong. Now, I've said many times I'm not trying to get evolution out of the schools. I just want the lies out of the textbooks. We almost got a bill passed in Arkansas a couple of years ago, and I went up to Arkansas and testified before the Senate, before the House Representatives Committee that was looking at this bill, HB 2548, I believe it was. And it was, the bill simply said, Arkansas will not use tax dollars to purchase materials if they contain knowingly fraudulent information. We're not going to buy books that have lies in them. And it gave a few examples, like some of the examples I gave in my seminar. If it says the embryo has gill slits, we're not going to buy it. I stood up and testified for 45 minutes before this committee. After I got done, the ACLU lady, a uh, woman I mean, she got up and she said, folks, this is an obviously an anti-evolution bill. One of the representatives said, uh, ma'am, evolution is not mentioned in this bill. All this bill says is we're not going to buy books if they have lies in them, and these things are lies, so we're not going to buy that book. How can you say this is an anti-evolution bill? And she said, everything mentioned in this bill is used to support the evolution theory. And the guy said, well, ma'am, is it true that these things mentioned here are, are, are false? She said, well, yes, but obviously this is an anti-evolution bill. She knew full well. If you, if you took all the lies out of the textbooks, there would be nothing left to support the evolution theory. I was in a debate one time at University of West Florida, and the uh, professor got up and he said, now, Mr. Hoven, you're claiming all these things are lies, and you're right, you're, all these things have been proven wrong, but, he said, I got a question for you. You told us we got to take all this stuff out of the book. What are you going to replace it with? <laughs> I said, uh, folks, what he's trying to not say is, uh, we want the kids to believe in evolution. We have to give them some evidence, and all we have are these lies, and you want to take these out of the book, so you better find some more evidence for my theory. I said, sir, if you don't have any evidence for your theory, I'm sorry. Maybe you ought to consider getting a new theory. I could suggest one for you, if you'd like. He did not like. <laughs> he don't want to hear about it, okay? All they have to support their theory are things that have been proven wrong many, many years ago. Here's some of the lies we covered in the first how many hours of this seminar so far. I'll just review them very, very quickly. The Colorado River was not formed slowly. Well, the Grand Canyon did not slowly form by the Colorado River running through it. Okay? The geologic column does not portray Earth's history. It does not even exist anywhere in the world. Rocks do not date the fossils. The fossils do not date the rocks. It is based on circular reasoning. We cover that on videotape number four. There are no index fossils. There's no such thing as an index fossil. The layers are not different ages. Petrified trees connecting them all prove the layers all formed at the same time. We cover that on video number four. Plants and animals are not related to each other. They have the same designer, but not the same uncle and grandpa. Change in species is not the real meaning of the word evolution. That's not really what they mean. There's a whole lot more to that. We covered that on video four. Natural selection does not cause any evolution. Natural selection selects. It doesn't create a thing. We believe in natural selection. The peppered moth story never happened. It's a lie. Comparative anatomy does not prove common ancestry. We covered that on videotape number four. Humans never have any gill slits. It's a human at conception. It's not a fish or an amphibian or anything else. And abortion is murder, plain and simple. Okay? The appendix is not vestigial. You do need your appendix. The whale does not have a vestigial pelvis. That is a lie. The human tailbone is not vestigial. If you think it is, I'll pay to have yours removed. <laughs> Dinosaurs did not live millions of years ago. Man did not evolve from animals or cavemen. The Big Bang is a big dud. It didn't happen. The horse series in your textbooks is a lie, proven wrong 50 years ago. Life cannot evolve from non-living matter like the textbook says. The law does not ban teaching creation science like some people want you to think. It's perfectly fine to teach creation science in the public schools. We'll get into more of that later. Smaller is not simpler. A little paramecium is more complex than a space shuttle. Smaller is not simpler. Smaller is more complex. But birds did not come from dinosaurs. Talk about a dumb idea. The eye did not arise by slow changes over billions of years. The first bird did not hatch from a reptile egg like Goulschmidt said. The trees of life in the textbooks are pure imagination. They didn't happen, folks. They drew it on paper, and that's as far as it goes. It didn't happen in reality. 
DNA does not prove evolution, it proves creation, it proves a designer. Fossils do not provide any evidence for evolution. Fossils don't count at all. You find a bone in the dirt, you can't prove that bone had any kids, <laughs> let alone kids that lived, and certainly not kids that were different than the grandparents. Fossils simply are a dead-end street. They don't count for evolution. The earth, was never, is, the earth is not billions of years old, and the earth was never a hot molten mass. The Pangea theory that's taught in your books never existed. They say, all the continents used to fit together. I get that all the time. Oh, do you think all the continents used to fit together? I used to touch each other? I said, well, they still are. Just the low places are full of water. I mean, the continents are still connected, you know. <laughs> what do you mean, did they? Hello. They still are. <laughs> Animals and plants are designed, not adapted to their environments. There are no simple living organisms. Life did not arise three and a half billion years ago, like the textbook says. The sun did not form before the earth, like the textbook says. Scientists have not made life in the laboratory. Snakes do not have vestigial legs. The earth never had an oxygen-free atmosphere, like the textbook says. No animal is related to any other kind of animal. DNA is more than just chemicals. It carries information. Mutations do not improve the species. Similar bone structure does not prove a common ancestor. It proves a common designer. Amino acids do not prove relationships. Humans are not related to chimps. Darwin did not prove evolution. Textbooks do not teach kids to think critically. They teach them to not think at all. Arranging animals on paper does not prove a thing. Archaeopteryx is not part reptile. It's 100% bird. Feathers do not evolve from scales. It's not just the religious fundamentalists who disbelieve in evolution. Most folks disbelieve in evolution. Evolution is not a light which illuminates all facts. There is no evidence for the magnetic reversals at the ocean floor. The Constitution does not discuss separation of church and state. It does not discuss that. The Supreme Court did not ban creation. Let's give a little bit of the history of what really happened. In the 1800s, almost all the textbooks were thoroughly packed with information about creation, Christianity, godly teaching, kids memorized Bible verses. I remember in public school in Illinois growing up, we memorized Bible verses and said prayer every morning. Didn't hurt the kids a bit. Helped them quite a bit. Back then, kids got in trouble for their own spit wads. Today, it's for bringing guns and shooting people. It's a different world, and some of you older folks know what I'm talking about. It has changed radically. In 1925, Tennessee passed a law that said you cannot, teach creation, you cannot teach evolution. It actually banned the teaching of evolution in the public schools. It's called the Butler Act. The ACLU, which is the American Communist Lawyers Union, decided they wanted to test this law. So they ran an ad in the paper said, we're looking for a teacher willing to claim that he taught evolution so we can have a trial to try to get this law overthrown. A guy named John T. Scopes volunteered. He said, I don't know if I taught evolution or not, but I did sub for a biology class one day, and I think all we had was a study hall, but if you want me to go testify that I taught evolution, I'll do it. So John Scopes went on the trial, lasted 10 days in the hot July Tennessee summer. After 10 days, John Scopes was found guilty of breaking the law. The law said, you can't teach evolution. He claimed he did, so he's found guilty. He, did, he admitted he did. He was fined 100 bucks. Case was over. Later, the fine was overturned on a technicality, but the judgment was not overturned. The evolutionists lost the Scopes Monkey Trial. If you want to read the entire story about what really happened, you can see it right here in this book, The Scopes Monkey Trial, the Tennessee, the world's most famous court trial. And by the way, if there's a movie circulating around your school called Inherit the Wind, you better be real careful about that. That's a dangerous movie. That takes, that does everything they can. It twists everything about the trial, to make the Christians look dumb. You want to read word for word every word that was spoken there? Here it is right here, the court transcript verbatim. You can get it from Bryan College in Dayton, Tennessee. The Dayton Courthouse is still there with a big uh, museum where you can go out through and see where it actually happened. If you go north of Chattanooga, about, I don't know, 70 or 80 miles, you can get to Dayton, Tennessee. Been through there a bunch of times. There's a good uh, video expose, I mean a good book uh, expose about the Inherit the Wind movie that circulates around. And just about every year, this is shown in public schools here in Pensacola where they try to teach the kids the Christians were dumb and they lost the trial. They changed all sorts of things about that. And you ought to be up in arms over that being shown to your kids. You can sign a statement saying, I don't want my child shown the movie Inherit the Wind. Have it notarized and take it into the school. They won't show your kid. You say, it's against my religious convictions to lie to my kids. And that movie's a lie. Okay? But I guarantee it'll be shown this year and next year and the next year. I saw it about four times growing up before I realized what a lie it was. You want to get the material from uh, Bryan College, there's their phone number, or from George Serrell, who has an excellent article about the Inherit the Wind, what really happened in the book, 
the real trial compared to the uh, Inherit the Wind movie, which is just baloney. Or you might want to get the book Ride to Glory. You can get it through our ministry. I don't read novels much, but this one is incredible. This guy said, what if the Scopes trial was redone this, this now, in the you know, 21st century, at a modern university? Whew. Brother, I couldn't put it down. I mean, I read a lot of books, but this one, I never should have started it, man. I, I, I couldn't. I didn't sleep for four days trying to finish that. <laughs> I wasn't quite that bad. But, um, in 1968, the last law banning evolution was overturned. Now keep in mind, there were many laws against teaching evolution until 1968. There's never been a law against teaching creation. The laws banned evolution. In 1980, the state of Arkansas passed a law and said, we want balanced treatment. If the teacher teaches evolution, they must also teach creation. You know, give it balanced treatment. The court in Arkansas, Eighth Circuit Court, I believe, struck that down and said, nope, this law is unconstitutional. They didn't say you couldn't teach creation. They just said you can't demand equal time. And the atheists st started going around saying, see, you can't teach creation. <laughs> That's not what the law said. It's not what the court said. They never said you can't teach creation. They just said you can't require that the teachers teach creation. If we passed a law in Florida that said the teachers are required to breathe, I bet that law would be struck down because, I mean, I mean, you probably ought to breathe, but they can't require that you breathe, right? And that's what happened with the Arkansas law. Then Louisiana passed a law requiring um, teachers to teach creation if they taught evolution. Again, balanced treatment. Supreme Court struck this one. It went all the way to Supreme Court. Supreme Court struck it down. After the 1987 ruling by the Supreme Court, Stephen Jay Gould, who hated creationists, and had a set of my tapes on his uh, shelf. I went up and visited his office. His secretary was there. She said, yeah, he's got your tapes right here, Mr. Hovind. I never did get to meet him. He died a few years ago. He knows better now. He's no longer an evolutionist. But uh, <laughs> Stephen Gould said after the verdict, he said, no statute exists in any state to bar instruction in creation science. It could be taught before and it can be taught now. They never said you can't teach creation. The court said you can't require it. That's all. And don't let anybody tell you different. That's what the law, that's where it stands right now. Uh, Michael Zimmerman said, and he's, about, he's an evolutionist, he said, the Supreme Court ruling did not in any way outlaw the teaching of creation science in public schools. Quite simply, it ruled that in the form taken by the Louisiana law, it's unconstitutional to demand equal time for this subject. Creation science can still be brought into science classrooms if and when teachers and administrators feel it is appropriate. Numerous surveys have shown that teachers and administrators favor just this route. And in fact, creation science is being taught in science courses throughout the country. Eugenia Scott is the president of the National uh, Center for Science Education. Well, what a lousy name. They're not, they're not in favor of science. They're in favor of defending evolution is all. She said, the Supreme Court decision says only that the Louisiana law violates the constitutional separation of church and state. It does not say that no one can teach scientific creationism, and unfortunately, many individual teachers do. Some school districts even require equal time for creation and evolution. Here's the web page, the head of the uh, front home page on the National Center for Science Education. Welcome to the home page of NCSE, a nonprofit, tax exempt membership organization working to defend the teaching of evolution against sectarian attack. We are a nationally recognized clearinghouse for information and advice to keep evolution in the science classroom and scientific creationism out. That's why they exist. I spoke in Berkeley last November, Berkeley, California, that's where these guys are located. I went and visited the National Center for Science Education. <coughs> it's a little bitty storefront building. They had, I think, four or five employees all crammed in this little building. I thought, this is the National Center for Science Education. <laughs> oh, yeah, property's expensive in Berkeley, I understand, you know, good place for them. I went in there, they didn't know who I was. I didn't tell them my name. I went in there, well, hey, what kind of information do you guys hear? I'm, I used to be a science teacher. And they began giving me pamphlets and articles and stuff, you know, from the Finally, one of the guys said, your voice sounds familiar. What's your name? I said, Kent Hovind. He said, I thought so. They taped a piece of paper on the floor that says Kent Hovind stood here. And I understand they won't walk on it. They walk around it. <laughs> <laughs> one of the guys came to all 10 hours that I lectured at Berkeley and asked me question after question after question. Look, these folks are not the enemy. Now, they do work for him, but they're not the enemy, okay? Satan is the enemy. They're just blinded, that's all. They're willingly ignorant, like the Bible says. But the, even the National Center for Science Education knows it's okay to teach creation if you want. William Provine said, teachers and school boards in public schools are already free under the Constitution of the United States 
to teach about supernatural origins if they wish in their science classes. Laws can be passed in most countries of the world requiring discussion of supernatural origins in science classes and still satisfy national legal requirements. And I have a suggestion for evolutionists. Include discussions of supernatural origins in your classes and promote discussion of them in public and other schools. Come off your high horse about having only evolution taught in science classes. The exclusionism you promote is painfully self-serving and smacks of elitism. Why are you afraid of confronting the supernatural creationism believed by the majority of persons in the U.S. and perhaps the worldwide? Good question. Why are they so afraid of this topic? I speak in public schools all the time. They, I'm telling you, some schools, though I can't get into, they are just absolutely afraid of having a creationist come in. There's no reason to fear. The fact is, most folks don't believe in evolution anyway. The fact is, there's no law saying you can't teach creation. Just go ahead. You don't know. It is against the law for the public school teacher to use tax dollars to try to convert the kids to be a Buddhist or Catholic or Baptist or something else. That is against the law. But it's not against the law to discuss creation. Provine said, shouldn't students be encouraged to express their beliefs about origins in a class discussing origins? If you're discussing origins, then uh, let's discuss origins. But see, in the mind of the evolutionist, your answer must be naturalistic. Suppose I said, I want you to explain how computers came to be, but you cannot use man as your answer. I want a naturalistic explanation of how computers came to be. Well, you're dead in the water right up front because of the definitions I gave. And the evolutionist says, we have to explain how the world got here, but we can't use supernatural as an explanation. Well, a duh. And what we got here is like two computers arguing with each other, does man exist? They can't see him, they can't touch him, they can't feel him. But he does exist. See, it's obvious the creator would be outside of the creation. He's above and beyond. He's not affected by what he created. God created time, space, and matter. He's outside of time, space, and matter. God's not affected by time. This is not 2003 in heaven. There's no time. And after we get to heaven, one of the first things you're going to do is flip your watch off and fling it over the side. You won't need that. There's no time there. We sing all these songs, you know, when we've been there 10,000 years. That's baloney. It's a good song. I like it. But we're not going to be there 10,000 years. We're just going to be there. Now, my brain can't handle that thought, but, you know, I can think about thinking about it. This public school teacher said, I'm a public school teacher, Mr. Hoven. I went to a conference today, and we were all given a new science textbook to use in the conference. It's called Sciences by Triffel and Hazen and Wiley, John Wiley and Sons. On page 611, it said this, To what extent do you think that parents should have the right to decide which scientific theories and ideas are presented in schools? To what extent do you think parents ought to have the right to demand that opposing religious views be taught as well? Should the views of creationism, which are primarily based on one particular type of Christianity, be given special consideration. It's getting more difficult to say the truth all the time. The teachers now are being trained in sessions to how to handle creationists. I know this, they work very hard to make you feel like you are the only one complaining. When I went to meet the lady in charge of the science curriculum here in Pensacola, Florida, when I first moved to town, I've been complaining about some of the lies in the textbooks and the science curriculum. And she said to me, Mr. Hoven, you are the only person in the county complaining about this. I thought, there's what, 128 Baptist churches in this town plus all the other flavors? I mean, where, what's everybody doing? Aren't we supposed to be the salt of the earth? Man, salt irritates. Go irritate somebody. That's our job. <laughs> Teachers can teach creation science in the classroom if they want. There's never been a law against it. Not only can you teach science, creation science in the public schools, you can teach it right out of the Bible. There's no law against reading your Bible in public school or bringing your Bible to public school. Or you can teach or devote a class to religion, and you can have a text, the textbook be the Bible. We know the effects what happened in 63 when the Bible was taken out and evolution was put in the schools, but we got deceived by the ACLU. In 1963, the Supreme Court banned the use of the Bible to get kids saved which is not good, obviously, but it's a lot better than what the ACLU led us to believe. They did not throw the Bible out. We have thrown the Bible out because we have allowed ourselves to be deceived by the ACLU. You might want to get the website uh, BibleInSchools.net and get the information by Elizabeth Rittenauer. She helps, helps people start Bible classes in their public school. Preacher, how'd you like to go every day and teach a Bible class to the public school kids at Tate or at Scambia High? Wouldn't it be awesome? You can do it. She, can, she knows how to cut through all the red tape and get it done. 
ACLU. Well, we can talk a long time about that. Call uh, BibleInSchools.net, get a hold of Elizabeth, or get the book from us, Teaching Creation Science in Public Schools. And, you know, it's certainly fine to do that, and many schools do. States can require teachers to discuss evolution. They can do that. But they set the state standards. The state school board or the legislature will rule and say, this is what we want the kids to know by third grade or by fifth grade or by seventh grade. They have state standards. And they sometimes include evolution. You, the kid must know about evolution by eighth grade. Now the problem is, the atheists are really good at packing that committee. That way you only have to have five or six atheists in the whole state and you can control what all the kids are learning. And then the Christians wait till the books are chosen to meet the standards and get in the classroom and then we complain about the books in the classroom. You're about three years too late. State standards are going to be selected for Florida textbooks in the next two months. This is the time. It'll affect the books that they buy in 94, September 94. Now is the time to do something. The states cannot require them to discuss creation. It's already been tried many times. And I've seen so many people waste enormous time and money on an effort trying to force creation into the schools. I'm telling you, you're wasting your time. It's not going to happen. And the atheists love it when a campaign gets started and say, we're going to make the schools teach creation. They love that. They just let you spend all your money and waste all your time and then defeat you in the last five seconds. They're not going to go anywhere. The teachers may discuss creation if they like in their class. They've always been allowed to do that. You might want to get a hold of the website textbookreviews.org, Mel Gabler. They've for 40 some years have been doing research on public school textbooks and what's being taught. Mel said, the courts allow states to require discussing scientific weaknesses in evolution theory, but not requiring discussing evidence for creation. You can't make the teacher talk about creation, but you can require them to talk about the weaknesses in the evolution theory. That's a start. In the landmark decision back in uh, 1963, the court held, it certainly may be said that the Bible is worthy of study for its literary and historic qualities. Nothing we have said here indicates that such study of the Bible or religion when presented objectively as part of a secular program of education may be affected consistently with the First Amendment. Supreme Court said, the Bible may constitutionally be used in an appropriate study of history, civilization, ethics, comparative religion, or the like. Eighth Circuit Court ruled and said, permitting public school observances which include religious elements promotes the secular cause of advancing the student's knowledge and appreciation of the role our religious heritage played in the social, cultural, and historical development of civilization. Teachers already possess the flexibility to present a variety of scientific theories about the origins of mankind and are free to teach any and all facets of this subject, 1987 Supreme Court. The court further ruled, teaching a variety of scientific theories about the origins of mankind to school children might be done with a clear secular intent of enhancing the effectiveness of science instruction. California State School Board said, discussions of any scientific fact, hypothesis, or theory related to the origins of the universe, the earth, and of life, the how, are appropriate to the science curriculum. They're telling their teachers, if you want to talk about creation, do it. Can't be more clear than that. If you want to keep up on the latest of what's happening in education, you might want to watch the video, Crisis in the Classroom, from Eagle Forum, Phyllis Schlafly's organization. Now, I would disagree with Phyllis on several philosophical things, but I think she's got a great, done a great job with this video here on what's happening. So what do people say, what about the separation of church and state? Doesn't the Constitution say that? There's no such phrase mentioned in the Constitution. That phrase is found mentioned in a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to the Baptist Association in Danbury, Connecticut. The Constitution does not talk about separation of church and state. That's a lie. De Jefferson said, the First Amendment has erected a wall of separation between church and state. That's from his letter, not from the Constitution. By the way, this wall is a one-dimensional wall. It keeps the government from running the church, but makes sure the church Christian principles will always stay in government. Go see David Barton's excellent website, wallbuilders.com. You want to get more on how the, all the founding fathers believed the church had to influence government or up, government would go corrupt. Well, it's happened. What's happened over the years, several different people have taken upon themselves to survey the textbooks and see how much evolution is in this book. These guys did a survey of all the biology books used in 1991 and they found out the one used by Merrill called Biology and Everyday Experience only had 2.9% of the text devoted to evolution. It really wasn't talked about much. However, HBJ had 15.6%. They really crammed evolution down the throat of those kids. I've seen books today that have nearly 30%. Well, if I was on the committee to select textbooks this year, I would pick the least poisonous book I could find. 
And then I would write to the publishers of the other ones and say, hey folks, we did not pick your book this year because, and spell out your reasons. And then I would write to the one I did pick and say, hey fellas, we did pick your book this year because you got the least amount of evolution. However, we, need, we would like that out also. And we want to warn you, if we find another one next time that has less, we're going to buy them. You see folks, there's only one language these textbook publishers speak. The only language they speak is money. Now if you were the CEO at HBJ, Harcourt Brace Jovanovich, and you got letters from all over the country from people saying, hey, we did not buy your book this year because guess what you're going to do next year? Only language they speak, brother. If you want to get an excellent book on some of the lies in the textbooks to see what you ought to be watching for, get this one here by uh, Jonathan Wells, excellent book on icons of evolution. Or you may want to get the book by the Gablers. They've spent 40 years discussing lies in the textbooks and what you can do about it. Excellent ministry in Longview, Texas. Go to uh, textbookreviews.org or to uh, crsc.org. They've got a newer review of the more modern textbooks. Mel wrote me a letter, said, Dr. Hovind, thank you for using our book. What are they teaching our children? You'll be interested to know that in the 39 years of work, we've never seen publishers so sensitive or schools so receptive to our textbook reviews and ranking. We're pleased to recommend Harcourt Scott Forsman Elementary Science. They are much less dogmatic on evolution than the others we reviewed. Mel says the publishers are scared to death of their letters of recommendation because they know there's the sales of those that aren't recommended plummet in the states. But here's what happens. They only work in Texas. Texas is one of the largest publishers of text, or largest buyers of textbooks in the nation. So the publishers will publish all these books, you know, spend billions of dollars, millions of dollars publishing these books. They try to sell them. If Texas doesn't buy them, you think they're going to burn them? No, they're going to go peddle them off in some other state that's not looking. The Gablers have a crew of folks, they'll help, find, they'll help find errors in the textbooks. Like a book might say, you know, George Washington was Abraham Lincoln's vice president or something like that, you know. Dumb stuff. And they're not about to throw that book away. I mean, they spent a lot of money printing that thing. Nice beautiful paper, you know, colored pictures. They're going to find some state that's not looking. So if you're in some state other than Texas, you better really be on the lookout. Get a hold of the Gablers and they'll tell you which ones to watch for. And they work on a donation basis and don't be a tightwad with them. Send them 50 bucks and say, here, send me your letters of recommendation. Adolf Hitler said, let me control the textbooks, I'll control the state. What's in these books anyway? And what can I do to fix this problem? Well, this chart shows how the atheists have rated the different states in America and how well they teach evolution. They think here in Florida we're doing a lousy job of teaching evolution. Yay. They think, they, they, they think the folks in Minnesota, where I was yesterday morning, are doing a wonderful job teaching evolution. You ought to be ashamed of yourself in Minnesota. Get that junk out of your textbooks, okay? You can get creation materials and put them in your library. Bert Wagner, up in Ohio, uh, Iowa, knows how to cut through all the red tape and get this done. Get a hold of Bert and say, well, how do I get public schools to accept creation books? One guy wrote me a letter and said, Dr. Hoven, your video series was bought for our local high school, Waverly High, in Ohio. When I went to check out video number five, I found someone had hidden the box of seminars and date debates unopened and underneath a desk by a back wall. I was told by the librarian that she was told not to put them out for the students to find. My 18-year-old daughter witnessed this. We were very upset, but I was told it was proof that the enemy was trying to void and hide the truth. My daughter has since graduated and don't know if those tapes are available to students or not. So if you do no donate something, be sure to check and make sure it is, you know, kept on the shelf. I went to a bit, one big university one time and I spent probably an hour going through their computer search system looking for how many books they had on evolution. It was like 18 or 1900 books about evolution. And then I searched for, to see how many books they had about creation. This is a big university library. Not one book. I searched every author that I know and I know most of them. I went to the librarian and I said, uh, I noticed you got 1800 books on evolution but you don't have any books on creation. Why is that? She said, there is too a good book in here on, on creation. She said, I put it in here myself. It's from my church, the Watchtower Society. <laughs> oh, brother, we got one Jehovah's Witness book in here <laughs> and 1800 teaching evolution. And then they brag about being a liberal university and giving the kids a liberal education. You're lying. A liberal education is when you look at all sides. Let's just discuss all sides and then decide where the truth lies. They don't want to compare evolution with creation because evolution looks stupid next to the truth. 
There's some practical things we can do, folks, to fix this. Number one, you can demand that the schools cut out the pages with false information. You don't have to get creation in the schools and you don't have to get evolution out, just simply get the lies out. You can tell them you want them to glue the pages together, or you can at least put a warning sticker in the front cover saying, kids, the information on page 97 is not correct. Or, you know, list the pages. I've volunteered many times and I'll do it again. I will, if you will send me your textbook, I will check the pages that need to be torn out. I'll make a tape recording while I'm traveling someplace and I'll hand you the tape and it'll say, you know, the information on page 84 is wrong, tear that page out, and you know, page 217 is wrong, and I'll list the pages. And if you, got, if you tore the pages out of the book, it won't cost the school one penny. I'll show you. It's so simple. Because the first objection they're going to say is, oh, this would cost the schools a lot of money. It won't cost them a penny. How many of you would volunteer to tear the pages out of the books and bring your own scissors? Let me see. There you go. So when you go to your school board, hand them a list of 500 names and say, these people are willing, to, when would you like it done? Won't cost a thing. Look, the book is not sacred, it's made out of paper, you know. If you, if you bought it, the county bought it, it belongs to the school. If you want to tear a page out, that's perfectly fine. I was in a debate with a professor at university, I was just speaking at UWF here oh, a year or so ago, and I mentioned tear the page out of the book, and this one professor said, I don't think we should deface textbooks. I said, well, sir, if you were teaching math, and you came across the book that said, you know, 2 plus 2 is 5, what would you do? He said, I would tell the students to mark out the wrong answer and write in the right answer. I said, oh, you would deface a textbook? I said, now, sir, if you were teaching biology and you found a book that said the embryo has gills and you know that's proven wrong in 1874, what are you going to do? He said, well, nothing. I said, you wouldn't correct it? He said, no. I said, well, then you, sir, are a hypocrite. And you got no business using tax dollars to lie to these kids. You ought to get a different job changing tires or picking peaches and work for a living for a change. Guys like that burn me up, brother. <laughs> like a leech, you know, sucking on somebody else's blood that they built, you know. Number four, you can give the kids my little brainwashed book. There are different people around the country that buy these by the thousand and give them out to people in their schools. One guy from Santa Rosa County bought 3,000 of these books several years ago, gave them to all the kids in the county. They're going to have a hard time teaching evolution for a while over there. Buy some books or go to your school board and say, would you please vote to purchase this book to go along with our biology book so the kids can see the lies in their books. If the school board buys them, great. If you get them you know, more than 10, you get them for a dollar a piece. If the school board says, no, we don't want those books in school, then you run a full page ad in your paper, stop by the following address and pick up the book the school board banned. Now the kids will get it and read it. Mm-hmm, yeah. Florida has a law. They've changed the number now. It used to be 233.09E, uh, e, I believe, but they changed it so people couldn't find it, I guess. It's now statu Florida Statute 1006.35, Accuracy of Instructional Materials. Do you know, Florida, state of Florida legislature, can vote to recall books if they're, if they're not accurate. They can, they can write letters to the publishers and demand that they change the books. The laws on the books, folks, the, there's the, the textbooks are supposed to be accurate, but they're not. They contain 50-some lies in every textbook I've seen. Get the pages out. Texas has a law requiring textbooks to be accurate. Wisconsin has a law requiring textbooks to be accurate. Alabama has a law that says textbooks shall be adequate and current. Well, if they're still teaching the baby has gill slits, they're not current. They're 128 years behind the time. Alabama had, used to have a sticker, they modified it now, watered it down some, but the sticker used to say, this textbook discusses evolution, a controversial theory. And students need to be, learn there's a difference between microevolution, which is a fact, and macroevolution, which is not a fact. Go Bama. California has a requirement, textbooks shall be factually accurate. Many states have this requirement, but they're just simply not enforcing it. Did you know the publishers will publish a special book just for our state? If the committee got together and said, look, well, Glencoe, we like your book, however, we want you to take out chapter 3 or take out the following pages. Do you know how much money is spent just in one school district on textbooks? A publisher would be foolish not to, you know, to turn down a contract for three quarters of a million dollars. They'll publish a special book. They do it all the time for different states. Get on that committee and do something about it. You can also 
parents be aware that your kids can be exempted from anything you don't want them taught. If you don't want your kids taught evolution, you sign a little paper that says, I do not want my student taught evolution. It's against my religious convictions. Have it notarized, signed, and give it to the school principal, the teacher, superintendent. And if they do teach your kid evolution, or if they say, oh, you've got to stay in class, then you can simply say, do you discriminate against people because of their religion? Ooh, that'll get their attention. Now, here are some pitfalls you've got to watch for in your school. I've seen this so many times. If the school is going to have a good program, some left-wing liberal will make sure that it's an opt-in program. In other words, you have to get parents' permission to go to the program. This happens all the time when I speak in schools. The kids have to come back with a note and saying, it's okay for me to go to Hovind's program. But if you're going to have some homosexual speak in your school, or some lesbian about the gay lifestyle, which is not gay at all, and it's not a lifestyle, it's a death style, if they're going to speak in your school, they'll make sure it's an opt-out program. You see the difference? In other words, you have to get a note in order to not come. But if it's a good program, you've got to get the note to go. And if it's a bad program, you've got to get a note to not go. They don't want a level playing field, folks. And if you have a superintendent or a school principal that tries that one, you ought to help him get a different job, too. Put the pressure on. He just needs to find a new job, maybe in a new county someplace. Some practical steps you can do. Number one, kids, don't confront your teachers publicly. Try to talk to them after class. Now listen carefully. If you are late to class frequently, if you're a troublemaker or a goof-off, if you never do your homework, if you don't pay attention in class, then please don't tell them you're a Christian. <laughs> Shut your mouth. <laughs> First, be a good student. Now, if a question comes up on the test that says, you know, how old is the earth? And you know the answer they want. You can simply write on the test, the textbook says 4.6 billion. However, this is not correct. Now they know you learned the book, you did your homework, but you don't believe it, you didn't swallow it. That's perfectly fine. Number two, you can ask to be exempt. Now parents have to do this, the kids can't do it. I, I'm not positive of that statement, but I believe it has to be done by the parents. You have to say, I want my child exempt from anything that's against our religion. Sign a note, give it to the school. Look, if 40 or 50 or 60 percent of the class was standing out in the hallway, it wouldn't take the teacher long to figure out, you know, we ought to just skip that chapter. I had one guy call me up one day, he said, Brother Hovind, my second grade daughter has watched your videotapes probably 50 times. She can quote them. I don't know why kids watch the same tape over and over and over and over. He said, my second grade daughter's teacher just called me. And she said, sir, every time I talk about something in the class having to do with evolution, your, your daughter stops me and says, ah, oh, teacher, don't, that's not right. And the teacher said, I just want you to know, I'm going to skip evolution for the rest of the time this girl's in my class. My first thought was, yay, this is great. And then I thought, why are we sending second graders off to war? Why aren't the parents fighting this battle? You know, the second grader ought to be able to go to class and read the book and believe what they're taught. Why are we allowing lies in the textbooks? Why are we, laying, why are we allowing liars in the te in the, to teach? <laughs> Don't lie to the kids. You can contact Joe Baker. He helps folks set up meetings on... Uh, getting kids in their school fired up on to do something in their local school. Joe had me come speak at his high school in Pennsylvania. They had an auditorium seats about a thousand people. They had 1,500 people come. The, fire, the pr principal was pulling his hair out, nervous as a cat, thinking the fire marshal's going to come you know, arrest me and throw me in jail. You know? They turned away like 300 people at the door said, no, you can't get in. And I spoke for over two hours at that public high school in Pennsylvania. Joe Baker arranged the whole thing and he's been on fire for God ever since. Get a hold of him say, what can I do in my school? If you're a public school student and you want to do something, Joe can help you get going. Um, some practical steps. You can give your teachers a video to watch at home. You can pray for them. Teaching is a tough job. My brother's in his 34th year. He said, Kent, it's not fun anymore. I can't wait to quit teaching. I'm, about, I'm sick of this. Teaching public school up in Illinois. My mom retired from teaching public school. You can invite your teachers to a creation seminar. You can have them call me with any questions. You can ask my secretary, Martha, sitting right there. I take questions all day long and half the night. I'll be glad to help. You can ask them to have a creation speaker speak in your public school. I've got a list of about eight pages of names of other people that speak on creation. We'll be glad to get somebody to you as quick as we can. You, some of you could run for school board. You could influence the textbook selection committee. You could pass or enforce the laws requiring books to be accurate. The Bible says the fear of man bringeth a snare. And we got a bunch of Christians that are scared to do anything for fear somebody might not like them. Uh, duh, <laughs> we're supposed to be Christians, you know. They didn't like the disciples very well or Jesus himself, did they? 
Our job is to do what's right. Leave the results up to him. Okay. You can try to convert the teachers or the students. You can write letters to the editor. That's what got my whole ministry started, brother. You and I were working together at the factory at M&A. Article came out of the newspaper that said, Dinosaur bones are found from 80 million years ago. And I wrote my first ever letter to the editor. I'd never written to the, letter, to the editor before. I said, these dinosaur bones were from the flood of Noah, 40, 400 years ago. Well, man, you would have thought I shot the sacred cow. <laughs> For the next six or eight months here in Pensacola, I got called every name you can imagine in the paper. And I wrote letters back and forth, and they, other people wrote letters. And Finally, the university asked me to come do a debate, and a couple churches asked me to come speak, and now it's 14 years later, and I've got 30 people on my staff, and get, what, 20 calls a week, Martha, asking me to come? <laughs> 55? <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy. There's a war going on. Get in. Amen. Find something to do. You could donate some creation books to your public library or public school library. We get calls and letters just about every week from somebody getting saved because they watched a book, watched a video or read a book that they checked out of their public library. One of our videos. Donate some. You could educate others to use creation as a means of evangelism. Here's what the ACLU will do, though. They will threaten a lawsuit if somebody tries to teach creation. Now, they know they would lose, but it doesn't matter. The fact that it's going to be a lawsuit is going to be costly for the school. So the ACLU, knowing they'll lose, threatens to sue, and sometimes even sues, knowing the school will back down for fear of not having enough money to defend themselves. They're winning by default. They claim teachers can only teach what is in state-approved curriculum. Well, that's a lie. The curriculum really starts when the classroom door closes. Every teacher knows that. And every teacher discusses things in their class that are not in the textbook. <laughs> Come on, you can't teach otherwise. They claim teachers cannot correct the curriculum. That's a lie. They do it all the time. I taught math and science for years. I was always making corrections in the math book. And they mislead people into thinking that evolution is a sacred part of science that's never to be questioned. They use peer pressure or ridicule to silence those who oppose lies in the textbooks. Now, if you're going to do something, you be prepared for opposition from the enemy. Satan protects his evolution theory with a vengeance. This is the foundation for all sorts of things. Roger DeHart, science teacher at Burlington Edson High School in Seattle, was told he could not inform students of errors in the textbooks just simply by passing out current science journals. If there's a current science journal that said this is wrong, he couldn't tell his students because in the book it said it was right. Some of these lies have been proven wrong 100 years ago. Kevin Haley, biology teacher at Oregon Community College, lost his job simply for exposing errors in the textbooks. Baylor University, formerly Christian University, fired William Dembski just because he advocated intelligent design. He said there must be a designer. Forrest Mims was a science writer for 20 years. He published in National Geographic, Science Digest, American Journal of Physics, 60 magazines and newspapers. He was denied a job as science writer or writer for Scientific American simply because he was a creationist. Rod Levake in Fairbault, Minnesota uh, was reassigned because he doubted Darwin's theory. They said, we don't want you teaching evolution. We don't want you teaching biology if you doubt Darwin's theory. Dan Clark in Lafayette, Indiana, uh, he quit because he was reprimanded for teaching an evolution alternative. The superintendent, Mr. Ed Eller, told him not to introduce creationism to this class. Well, Mr. Ed Eller, you need to get a different job. We are grass needs mowed once in a while. Come on down. We might put you to work if you're a hard worker. Okay? He said, I'm quitting. I'm not going to take this. There's all kinds of articles here. Dean Kenyon was a tenured professor in San Francisco at the university. He'd been teaching for years. He wrote books about evolution, how wonderful evolution was. He was the poster boy of the evolutionist. And then one day he got converted, and they fired him. But he said, hey, I got, I got 20 years. You can't fire me. Oh, okay. They put him in as a lab assistant, you know, washing test tubes. Had to go through a whole big lawsuit just to get his job back, simply because he doubted Darwin's theory. So don't think it's going to be an easy road. There's some things you can do. Cut the pages out. Get something done in your area. There's all kinds of practical steps. You can watch our video four for other stuff like that. All right. Why is this theory dangerous? It's dangerous because it's bad science backed up by lies. Number two, it brings forth bad fruit. All the effects of evolution that I know of are evil and wicked. We teach the kids they're an animal. We teach them there's no moral standard. There's no absolute. What do you expect? This theory has led directly to the rise of communism, humanism, Marxism, Nazism, socialism. 
and the coming New World Order. The dangers of this evolution theory. Folks, it's not just dumb, it's dangerous. You're going to be shocked and see how many, to see how many people have died because of this theory. Why did we fight the Vietnam War? Why did we fight World War II? Why was World War I fought? Why are we fighting against communism? How many people did Hitler kill? How many did Stalin kill? We'll cover all that tomorrow night. Well, let's continue now with what we talked about last night, about the dangers of the evolution theory. We talked, answered the question, or began answering the question, why is evolution a dangerous theory? We talked about the fact that it's bad science based on lies. Kids do not learn how to think when all they're taught is this evolution theory. It's like me asking somebody to explain how computers came to be, but you cannot use man as your answer. You have to give a naturalistic explanation. Well, you've already shut out the only logical answer. And the kids are in school are tr trying to learn how the universe came to be, but it can't be God. It's got to be something else. Well, you already shut out the only logical answer. So they're not learning how to think. It's a dangerous theory for science. It's a, it's a hindrance to the advancement of science, and it brings forth bad fruit. The Bible says an evil tree, every good tree which bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Evolution is the foundation philosophy for humanism. The idea that man is God of the universe. The humanist philosophy is talked about in Romans chapter 1. It says, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, so God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. You ought to read all of Romans chapter 1 and see the steady slide people go down once they reject God as the Creator. This fellow said, do humanists believe in a supreme being? Emphatically, yes, that supreme being is man. Humanists have no knowledge of any being more supreme. Well, I would be glad to introduce them to one if they'd, be, if they'd lie. I know one. Amen. It's a whole lot more supreme. I mean, can you imagine? If the infinite God could fit in your little three-pound brain, it wouldn't be very big, and he sure wouldn't be worth worshiping. Man, the God that I worship is beyond comprehension. Amen. I mean, he tells us a lot about himself, but your brain just can't handle it. Neither can mine. So... This guy said, the turning point in history will be the moment that man becomes aware that the only God of man is man himself. Some of these guys think they are God. Boy, that was Hitler's philosophy. I'm God. I'm God. I'm God. I'm God. I'm God. I'm God. Hey, Gabriel, come and listen to this. Ha, 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 ha. We're not such big stuff, folks. <clears throat> George Wald, the Nobel Prize winner, said, I will not accept that, talking about creation, philosophically, because I do not want to believe in God. Therefore, I choose to believe in that which, is I, know is that which I know is scientifically impossible. Spontaneous generation arising to evolution. He said, I know it's not possible, but the only other alternative is God did it. And I don't want that, so I'll believe the impossible. Well, you're going to feel awful stupid for eternity. No one, you missed the opportunity to live forever with the creator of the universe because you were willingly ignorant, just like 2 Peter says. This guy says, we no longer feel ourselves to be guests in someone else's home. He's talking about God. This is Rifkin, who's one of those tree huggers who writes all kinds of books about, you know, save the environment, kill all the people, but save the environment. Jeremy Rifkin said, we no longer feel ourselves to be guests in somebody else's home and therefore obliged to make our behavior conform to a set of pre-existing cosmic rules. It's our creation now. We make the rules. We establish the parameters of reality. We create the world, and because we do, we no longer feel beholden to outside forces. Talking about God, of course. He said, we no longer have to justify our behavior, for we are now the architects of the universe. We are responsible to nothing outside of ourselves. So we are the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Wow, he's right. The Bible said in 2 Peter, in the last days, scoffers would come that would be willingly ignorant of how God made the heavens and the earth, and the earth was standing into the water and out of the water. We cover all that on video number two. The Bible says the scoffers are going to be walking after their own lust. You know, the only reason people reject God is because of their lust. There's no scientific reason to reject the Bible. There's no scientific reason to reject the creation account. There's no scientific reason to reject the idea that there's a creator. But some people just don't like the idea of God telling them what to do. The idea of God chaps their hide. Well, I tell them they better get some Vaseline, man. They're going to need it because we're going to be judged by the very God you don't believe in. This guy says, 
We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for uns unsubstantiated just so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. He said, materialism is an absolute. We cannot allow a divine foot in the door. A professor that I had at, uh, in Illinois Central College in East Peoria, Illinois, wrote a really cool article years ago. It was two computers, computers arguing with each other, does man exist? <laughs> Showing the absurdity of two humans trying to argue, does God exist? The computers couldn't see, them, couldn't see man, so therefore he didn't exist. And they were going through all kinds of explanations of how, you know, they gradually got all this circuitry by ch blind chance. The same kind of dumb arguments the evolutionists do, trying to explain how life arose by chance. What happened? Satan put it into the heart of some of his followers that they should build a kingdom and rule the world. And they really have serious plans to build a world empire right here. And you and I do not fit in. Matter of fact, they're anxious to get rid of us, big time, okay? Secretly, secretly Satan plans to use his followers to destroy much of humanity. But then he's going to destroy them also. The communists have done that for years. They always get some revolutionaries to go in and take over a country. And the first thing the communists do when they take over, they kill the revolutionaries that, that killed everybody else because they can't trust them. And Satan, Satan is using some of his followers, and they've got it in their head that they need to reduce the population of the planet. We cover all that on videotape number one or on our college course, CSE 101. We cover that in great detail, how that there are people who think we should reduce man's population here to one half billion. You can go to Elberton, Georgia and see the Georgia Guidestones where it says right on there, maintain humanity under a half billion. Right now there are six billion. They want to reduce the population by about 95%, according to Ted Turner. I said, well, go ahead, Ted, you first. <laughs> they just get off any time you want. Now, if evolution is true, then who owns the world? Who makes the rules? How do we determine right from wrong? I've asked people all over the place, how do you tell right from wrong if evolution is true? There simply is no possible way to tell right from wrong. It's a real simple question, but they have no answer. You can't tell right from wrong if evolution is true. Uh, if man is God, and this is what evolution means, then man makes the rules and the strongest survive. Might makes right. There's no way to tell right from wrong. I had a professor tell me one time, there are no absolutes. I said, are you absolutely <laughs> sure? <laughs> Blew his little brain. Now let me think for just a minute. How can I be absolutely? Yeah, of course they're absolutes. Kids today are wandering around in this world with no moral anchor because they don't know right from wrong. They really don't. There simply is no way to tell. Now, folks, there's a war going on, and you're going to have to decide which side you want to get on. You can't be neutral in this one. During the Civil War, this one fellow decided he did not want to get involved. By the way, it's not the Civil War. It's Abe Lincoln's War. Another long story. We cover that on CSE 103. <laughs> okay the college class number three, uh, 103. During the Civil War, though, this guy decided he, did not, he didn't want to get involved. So he put on a Yankee jacket and rebel pants. He said, both sides will leave me alone now. Well, after the battle, he was found dead, his Yankee jacket full of rebel bullet holes and his rebel pants full of Yankee bullet holes. <laughs> Folks, there's a war going on. You might as well get on one side or the other. Just give it all you got. Give it to your general, okay? You just say, Lord, here I am reporting for duty. What would you like me to do? Here's the problem, as I understand it. There's a war going on between Satan and God. We are the battlefield. People are going to get hurt. People are going to get killed. You better just get on one side or the other. The decision is very simple. You just decide which side you want to be on and then do whatever your general says. If you want to serve the devil, you just go ahead. If you want to serve God, come on. It's wonderful. Henry Morris has a tremendous book on this topic, The Long War Against God. If you want to understand the history of the evolutionary conflict, this one is awesome. There's another one, I don't know if it's a close second or maybe a tie with this one, called In the Minds of Men by Ian Taylor. One of the best books I've ever read covering the, the whole history of this. Why do people think this way? And I encourage people to read good books. Now kids, you're going to be the same person you are 20 years from now as you are right now, except for the books you read and the people you meet. Shut off the TV once in a while and read some books. There are many good books that will influence you forever. Man, I've read books that just changed my life, brother. You, know, you come across some, it's like, wow, you're just a different person from then on. Now, the Christians have an incredible advantage in this war. Uh, I read the last chapter. 
we win. Amen. Now, between now and then, it's going to get pretty bad. We're going to cover some things tonight about the New World Order. It might be a little scary. Folks, you don't need to get nervous. I read lots of books about the New World Order. I think I have a fairly good grasp of what's going on. I read about the microchip and all kinds of things happening, you know, and I see the world events, and then I go to sleep. Because Psalm 2 is a great tranquilizer for that. We cover a whole lot more on the New World Order on our CSE Class 103 for college, four different college courses that we offer. You can call our website for that. We're going to trace a little bit of the history of the conflict and then tell you what you can do about it. Things, practical things you can do for your general. God created the world. He owns it, and He makes the rules. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's. If you don't like it, then go make your own world. <laughs> but He owns this place. About 6,000 years ago, probably within the first few hundred years after the creation, Lucifer decided he wanted to be God. There's no possible way Lucifer fell, Lucifer fell from heaven before the creation. We cover all that on videotape number two about the gap theory and the day-age theory. Satan could not have fallen before the creation. So sometime after the creation, maybe 100 years, Lucifer decided he wanted to be God. So <clears throat> God created the world. Satan rebelled against God and tried to destroy his creation. That's the subject of this session. First of all, it appears that uh, Satan wants to do at least three things. He wants to make mankind wicked so God will have to destroy them. Satan made everybody wicked in the days of Noah, and God had to kill them all, all but Noah and his family. So Satan works very hard to make people wicked just so that God will have to destroy his creation. That's one of Satan's goals. Number two, he wants to convince some men to destroy other men. You guys like Adolf Hitler thinking they ought to kill the Jews, and guys like Paul Pot thinking they ought to kill the Cambodians. I mean, people think they ought to kill everybody. You got guys in the Taliban think they ought to kill anybody that won't convert to Islam. And by the way, the Koran clearly teaches if a person will not convert to Islam, they should be executed. We cover all that on video number seven. Now, praise God for the people that are trying to reach the Muslims, and they need the gospel like everybody else. But they're in the middle, they're absolutely brainwashed with the silly idea that if they're a good, faithful member of the Islam, they get to go to heaven and get 72 wives. They never thought about the 72 mother in laws. They're <laughs> <laughs> having to feed them 72 wives. <laughs> Talk about, it, it's, we could get off on a long rabbit trail. We're going to do a whole videotape someday just on the dangers of Islam and that teaching. Now, the people can be saved and make great Christians. And God loves them, but He hates what they believe. They've been duped. You ought to get the book that we sell in our bookstore called The Prophet. If you want to understand the history of the Muslim church and how it got started, it'll scare you when you realize what, who started it and why. Get into that some other time. Number three, Satan wants to keep as many people from hearing the gospel as possible. And that's where the evolution theory comes into the textbooks. The kids have an alternative explanation for how the world got here, so they never even consider looking for the real creator of the universe. Satan's used many different people and methods to accomplish his goals. He makes men think he is God, makes man think he is God, and makes the rule. Satan knew this would lead to genocide. Once people think they're in charge, well, then they decide they're going to rearrange the world the way they want it. So we're going to kill those that we don't want to be here. Ezekiel 28 tells about Lucifer. It says, Thou wast perfect in the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. The heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. God said, I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut, cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? You know, Satan is, this battle is really Satan versus God. It's not, you know, us versus them or cowboys versus Indians. It's Satan versus God. That's what it really boils down to. Satan, Isaiah tells us that Satan said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to shake, the earth to tremble, and did shake the kingdoms? that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities? You know, Judgment Day, we're going to stand before God and we're going to see Satan getting ready to cast into hell. We're going to say, this is, the, this is it? That's it? How many saw the movie Wizard of Oz? Remember when they finally realized it's a little old man behind the curtain pulling those levers. That's it? That's Oz? <laughs> That's the way we're going to feel when we see Satan. You've got to be kidding. That's it? <laughs> when I went to... Um, Massachusetts, first time to speak at a church up there. I went to see Plymouth Rock, you know, where the pilgrims landed, you know, and we walked up to this little pavilion and the preacher said, well, go ahead and say it. I said, say what? He said, say what everybody says when they see Plymouth Rock. I said, that's it? 
He said, yep, that's it. That's what everybody says. <laughs> it's a rock about this big with a date on there, 1620, you know. That's it, yeah. We're going to look at Satan and say, that's the one that made the nations tremble? you got to be kidding. And the people who are going to go to hell for eternity are going to feel awfully dumb realizing they got, they got deceived by such a simple process. They were so blinded. How many of you have ever been fooled and you felt just real stupid afterwards? You ever do that? <laughs> like a duh, how could I be fooled by that? That's the way folks that go to hell are going to feel. Like, wow, you got to be kidding. Satan is making his plans to rule the world like pinky in the brain. <laughs> God's up in heaven laughing about it. Now look, when you get all nervous about the new world order, just read Psalms chapter 2. It's a great tranquilizer. Psalm 2 said, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against His anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. You know, they've got plans for a new world order. They really do. They have plans for an electronic currency where you can't buy anything without a chip in your hand or in your forehead. Plans are coming soon. There are plans to control the planet. They're, they want to control the food. They want to control the population. They want you to get a permit to cut your grass and cut down a tree on your property. they got plans to rule the world, folks, and it's serious. God's laughing about the whole thing. They're planning to build their kingdom. You've got to read the book of Daniel and see how this kingdom, how the, 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 tells, God tells the whole history right there. Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold, you know, the nearly pure kingdom absolute authority, then the silver chest and arms, and then the belly and thighs of brass, and the legs of iron, the Roman Empire. You can read through all the book of Daniel and see the five kingdoms. Well, the last kingdom is where ten kingdoms try to get together, but it's partly iron, partly clay. It's going to be a weak, and it's going to crumble. And in those days, the Lord's going to cut a stone out of the mountain without hands, and it's going to smite the image on the feet. God's going to set up His kingdom. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Started by Satan tricking Eve in the Garden of Eden. He said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, the first thing Satan always does is question God's Word. Then he said, Ye shall not surely die. That's an outright denial of God's Word. And then he said, Eve, if you eat off that tree, ye shall be as gods. That's the same technique he's always used. Make you doubt God's Word, then he denies God's Word, and then he says, See, you're going to be God. Wow, I get to be God. That's what humanism is all about. Satan's plan's always been the same. Make you doubt deny God's Word, and then deify mankind. Tell you, you can evolve. He tried the same thing with Jesus. He said, Jesus, if you fall down and worship me, all these things will I give you. Isn't that what he told him? I'll give you all this stuff if you just worship me. He's a liar. He doesn't own it to begin with. And Satan always promises people things if you'll follow me. He said, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Jesus answered and said, it is written. That's all you got to do, folks. When the devil starts giving you a hard time, just start quoting Scripture to him. He can't stand that. But he knows the Scripture really well. He'll take half a verse here and there. See what he did all through Scripture. Okay? He'll take half a verse. You just got to watch what he's doing. So a satanic high priest, uh, Aleister Crowley, said that his demon told him the year 2000 would mark the end of the superstition of Christianity and the beginning of the Golden Age, when those possessing the will to dominate would conquer and would ascend to godhood. Well, guess what, Mr. Crawley? You missed it. And you're not going to ascend to Godhood. You're going to descend to worm food. That's what's going to happen. Satan wants you to think you can evolve into a God. Now, what you believe determines how you behave. That's always been the case throughout the world. The Bible says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of man and the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Philosophy means the love of man's wisdom. Sophie means man's wisdom, where we get our word sophomore. Wisd soft means wise. More, where we get our word moron, means fool. A sophomore is a wise fool. That's the age where they usually think they know it all. <laughs> How many have been there before? You've seen those kind? Okay, yeah, sophomore. They pick the word very carefully for that age group. <laughs> soft means wise. Man's wisdom, philosophy, filio, the love of. Maybe you've been to Philadelphia, the city of brotherly shove, or whatever they call it. Okay. Uh, Evolution is nothing but a philosophy. It's not a science. It's a philosophy. It's a religion. What it does, it tries to make you think that we can take God out and put man in his place. There are some excellent books you ought to be reading if you want to get up on all the philosophy of man's wisdom. You can read uh, Seven Men Who Rule from the Grave. Oh, the philosophy of these seven guys who absolutely still, still govern the world today. People like Karl Marx, uh, Joseph Stalin, guys like that. 
Uh, you can read about the Fourth Reich of the rich, how the, some of the rich people in the world, I mean the super rich people, have plans to control the world, at big time serious plans. You want to get more on the Council of Foreign Relations and how they are involved. We, these are all books we sell in our bookstore. I have people that get, get after me, brother, There's a couple of other, I think, good friends of mine that uh, they say, oh, you get off on too many rabbit trails. Doesn't tie into creation. Oh, I think freedom ties directly into creation. Our founding father said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator. So to me, the creation movement ties directly into things like gun control, stuff like that. I don't have a problem with it at all. You know, coming from some country where they don't have our American roots, I can understand where they don't see how it fits in, but I'm sorry, it does fit in. Dr. Henry Morris has this great book about the long war against God. Now, evolution is the foundation philosophy for racism. How can you think one person is superior to somebody else? Some people thought, well, if, those neuro if there is no God and we just evolve from apes, which are dark colored, maybe the uh, white skinned people have evolved farther. By the way, racism's been around a long time, but boy, when Darwin's book came out, it's like throwing gas on a fire. Racism ex escalated incredibly after that. Evolution is the foundation philosophy for racism. Charles Darwin wrote a book. Here it is right here. It's called The Origin of Species. That's not the whole title to the book. They're kind of embarrassed by the whole title because it is very politically incorrect. I'll show it to you in a second. This book says, The Origin of Species. Now this book came out 1859. The evolution theory was around way before that. But Darwin simply made it popular. He gave them an excuse of how it happened. Now what is a species anyway? This textbook shows a bunch of different monkeys and says they're all different species. Okay, but they're the same kind of animal. They're still a monkey. And just because some guy decides that we've got, you know, 12 species of monkeys here, doesn't mean they're different kinds. They're still the same kind of animal. This textbook, used in Escambia for a while, shows the different, a uh, little more to the title. It says, Darwin's pub published his findings in a book titled, On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. That's still not the whole title. Here's the whole title to the book. You can look at it yourself. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Oh, favored races. Now, Charlie, that's not politically correct. Well, back in 1859 it was. 1859, we had slavery in this country, folks. Racism was very popular, even in the non-slave states. They didn't want them to be enslaved, but they still thought they were inferior in many cases. Darwin thought natives were just advanced animals. Darwin said in uh, the book Descent of Man, another book he wrote, he said, at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. Now, if a professor said that today, how long would he keep his job? By the way, you ought to go read the old newspapers, I mean like a hundred years ago, and see how they talked about the Indians as being savages. They always referred to them as savages like they're inferior somehow. Darwin said in his book, thus from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object we are capable of conceiving, the production of higher animals directly follows. See, Darwin's philosophy was messed up. He thought the more war, the more famine, the more death you have, the faster things evolve. The question is really very simple. Did man bring death into the world? Or did death bring man into the world? could not be more opposite. Darwin's philosophy says death brought man into the world. Now, you have to understand, in 1859, when this book came out, slavery was legal in many parts of the world. <coughs> By the way, there's still slavery going on today in many parts of the world, okay? Negroes were bought and sold like cows. You owned them like property. You could do with them as you please. They had absolutely no rights. Now, Henry Fairfield Osborne, who was the curator at the American Museum of Natural History, said, the standard of intelligence of the average adult Negro is similar to that of the 11-year-old youth of the species Homo sapien. He's trying to get across the idea that Negroes are a different species, isn't he? Uh, that's racism. Stephen Gould admitted, biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1850, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolution theory. Thomas Huxley was the guy who promoted Darwin all over the country. Darwin wrote his book and went and hid. Huxley went out and really preached Darwin. 
and made people accept what he said. Huxley said, no rational man, cognizant of the facts, believes that the average Negro is the equal, still less the superior of the white man. These are the guys who promoted Darwin. Uh, a guy named Kingsley, who was an Anglican priest who really promoted Darwin, also, you know, if it hadn't been for the church accepting Darwin in the 1850s and 60s, the scientists rejected it at first. They said, what a dumb theory. It was the Christians that accepted it. Kingsley said, the black people of Australia, exactly the same race as the African Negro, cannot take in the gospel. They can't get saved. He said, all attempts to bring them to a knowledge of the true God have as yet failed utterly. Poor brutes in human shape, they must perish off the face of the earth. They're inferior species. Brother, I was working in Longview, Texas at a church there. I was out 2 in the morning going to the store to get my wife some milk or something. I forget what it was. and get one of the babies something at that time. And Some guy had gotten drunk and he turned his car what he, down what he thought was a street, but it was a railroad track. He drove about you know, 30 feet and the car bottomed out and he stuck on the tracks. you know. And he's standing out there looking at his car. What, what, what happened here? You know, He's drunk. And, so I stopped to go see what I could do to help, and another guy stopped, and we're pushing this car back off the railroad tracks before a car comes along and turns it into a tin can, you know. And uh, this guy said, what are you doing out here in the middle of the night? It was an all-black neighborhood, right by the big ghetto housing project there. I said, oh, I, well, I came by here to see if any of my friends are up, because I, I know a bunch of people here in the housing project in the, in the ghetto here, and uh, I bring a lot of these folks to church. He said, you bring them to church? I said, yeah, I drive a bus, come in here every Sunday, bring a lot of them to church. He said, these people are all black. I said, yeah, so what? He said, well, why do you bring them to church? I said, well, I try to get them saved and, you know, help them uh, learn the Bible and go just like Jesus told me to do. He said, what do you mean get them saved? They don't have souls. I said, are you part of the KKK? He said, yeah, how'd you know? Oh, just a lucky guess, you know. <laughs> well, listen, you idiot, they do have souls as much as you do. The color of your skin makes no difference. In part seven, we talk about where the races come from. There aren't any races. There's one race called the human race. Now, there are different skin colors. I can show you different skin colors of cows, too. You know, black cows, brown cows, and white cows. But they all look the same in the meat locker. And they all taste the same on the hamburger, okay? And all humans are the same, regardless of the color of their skin. Here's the Mormon church's teaching, though, about Negroes. The Mormon church teaches, Negroes in this life are denied the priesthood. Negroes are not equal with other races. It's the Lord's doing. It's based on His eternal laws of justice and grows out of a lack of spiritual valiance of those concerned in their first estate. When I was living over on Burgess Road, I had two Mormon missionaries come knock on my door. They said, Mr. Hoven, we'd like to talk to you about the Lord. I said, that'd be great. Which Lord would you like to talk about, yours or mine? They said, oh, we worship the same God. I said, no, we don't. I said, tell me, fellas, does your God have a body like mine? They said, oh, yeah. I said, well, my Bible says God's a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. See, if He has a body, He can only be in one place at a time. But if He's a spirit, He can be in all places at all times, simultaneously. I said, does your God live on the planet Kolob, K-O-L-O-B? They said, yeah, we believe He does. I said, does your God have thousands of wives? They said, yeah, we believe He does. I said, does your God have normal physical relations with those wives and beget spirit babies in heaven? They said, yeah, we believe He does. I said, now, do you guys believe that if the spirit baby is a valiant spirit baby, if it's a good spirit baby in heaven, when it comes to earth, it gets a white-skinned body? But if it's a bad spirit baby, it gets a black-skinned body. Is that what you believe? They said, well, uh, <clears throat> you're not supposed to know that, but uh, yeah, that is what we believe. <laughs> By the way, that is what they believe. I said, now, fellas, let me see if I understand this. Now, <clears throat> your God in heaven supplies a spirit baby for every human baby born on earth. Is that right? They said, that's right. I said, okay, fellas, now listen. <clears throat> I know you have the little tag that says elder, even though you're 17. But uh, <clears throat> I said, fellas, I've been married uh, 30 years now. I've got three kids. I've got grandkids. I, have, uh, I taught biology and anatomy. I used to raise hamsters. I said, did you know there are two babies born every second? <clears throat> two per second, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I said, and your God supplies a spirit for every one. Uh, when does he get time to answer your prayers? Boy, they knocked the dust off their feet, and I guess I was anathema from then on, because they never came back, <laughs> brother. I don't know. I wanted to talk to them some more, but they didn't want to talk to me no more. <laughs> That's a dumb idea that you get black spirit babies up in <laughs> spirit babies in heaven. This is dumb. This is crazy, okay? It's not true. We're all equal. This Mormon apostle said, um, 
in a broad sense, caste systems have their root and origin in the gospel. It's by divine decree. He said, Cain, Ham, and the whole Negro race have been cursed with black skin, the mark of Cain. That is just silly, okay? This uh, Mormon apostle said, if there's one drop of Negro blood in my children, as I've read to you, they receive the curse. The curse of black skin. That's dumb. He said, shall I tell you the law of God in regard to the African race? If the white man who belongs to the chosen seed mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, the penalty under the law of God is death on the spot. This will always be so. By the way, you ought to read the book, The Secret History of the Mormon Church. Get the phone number there. Go to the website, UTLM, UtahLighthouseMission.org. If you want to get all the lowdown on how the Mormons have killed people for trying to leave the Mormon Church or for marrying someone who's not the right color. Now, I know I'm in the South, and I preach the same message all over the South, but if you think you're superior because of the color of your skin, you're wrong, you're stupid, and you're not right with God. Amen. Okay, I have brought thousands of black people to the Lord, and I intend to keep doing it, okay? And they're going to be in heaven whether you like it or not. But during the slave trade time in America here, the slaves were packed onto ships and brought over like cows. I mean, it was common for 20% of them to die. They would bring them on the ship and chain them to the deck, and that's where they stayed for two or three weeks. I mean, they ate, slept, and went to the bathroom, same place, for two or three weeks. They didn't get up. Brought them over. Miserable, miserable conditions they brought them into, and then sold them over here like cows. Now, praise God for the good people who tried to take care of them. You know, some people really were good to their slaves. But the whole concept of slavery is based on the idea that one person is superior because of the color of his skin or because of what he believes. This is based, goes right back to the evolution teaching. Now, some people thought the aborigines from Australia were inferior because they have bigger jaw bones, which is true. Their jaws are bigger. If you study the jaw of an aboriginal, the, the bone structure is heavier. And people say, see, that's proof of evolution. No, it's not. The aborigines are a nomadic society. They don't want to carry a toolbox around, so they carry the minimum with them. And when they get to where they got to go, they have to make their own tools again. And they use their teeth as a vice. They're constantly using their jaws as well as their hands, anything they've got, okay? And any bodybuilder will tell you, the more you build your muscles, the bigger the bones grow. So a person who's always using his jaws, his masseter muscles, is going to end up with bigger bones in response to that. After a lifetime of using your teeth like they do, you're going to have big jaw bones. It's got nothing to do with evolution. But somebody noticed this back 150 years ago and said, wow, the aborigines have bigger jaw bones. So they went over and began robbing the graves of the aborigines to get their heads for museums to be demonstrations for evolution. They treated the aborigines awful. If you've seen the movie Quigley Down Under where he brought people over there just to shoot the aborigines, that kind of stuff really happened. They thought they were just, you know, an animal. These two folks went to Australia to collect specimens for museums. Interesting story here in Creation Magazine. They said right here, a new South Wales missionary was the horrified witness to the slaughter by mounted police of a group of dozens of Aboriginal men, women, and children. Forty-five heads were then boiled down and the best ten skulls packed off for overseas. They shot them just to get their heads for museum displays. Now why would a museum want a head with a bigger jawbone? As part of, a, as part of an evolution display. Did you know the Smithsonian? I've been told, has 33,000 sets of human remains in their basement right now. They call it the Army of the Potomac. They would find people with the right jaw structures and put them on display in their museum. See, boys and girls, how this ape evolved to the human? When the intermediates, there's another human. You can go downtown Pensacola and line up 10 people and prove the same thing, folks. We could line up folks in this room. Some of you have bigger jaws and smaller jaws and sloped forehead and straight forehead. I had an Italian friend one time. I said, man, look at, i got to look at you from the side. You, I could put you in a textbook, you know? <laughs> his head went back like that. His nose stuck out. I said, you're the perfect missing link. <laughs> guy had an IQ way up there in the stratosphere. Brilliant guy. Just had a dumb-looking head, you know? <laughs> and by the way, the size of the head has got nothing, the brain has nothing to do with intelligence either. There have been some incredibly high IQ people with brain sizes down around 1,200 cc. And there have been some really dumb people with some really big heads with 2,000 cc brains, okay? It's got nothing to do with intelligence. America, though, during this early, late 1800s, because of the evolution theory primarily, had a large eugenics movement. Eugenics was the idea that we need to purify the race, get rid of the inferior genes, and only let the superior genes produce children. There was actually a sterilization movement. People who were mentally deficient were often sterilized, couldn't have any children. 
There was a large eugenics movement until World War II broke out. Galton was Darwin's cousin, and Galton was very, Francis Galton, very influential in the eugenics movement. He said, is the study of the agencies under social control, it is the study, eugenics is the study of the agencies under social control to, that improve or impair the racial qualities of future generations, either physically or mentally. That's Darwin's cousin. Now let's improve the race. Here's, one of their, here's their logo and their motto, the tree of eugenics. Eugenics is the self-direction of human evolution. They're going to use medicine, surgery, psychiatry, sociology, religion, education, genealogy. They use it all. Like a tree, eugenics draws its materials from many sources and organizes them into a harmonious entity. They were going to work really hard to improve humanity by eliminating inferior genes. This, this is a person very involved in this was uh, the one who started Planned Parenthood. We cover more on that on video number four. In 1904, the World's Fair was held in St. Louis, Missouri. One of the displays on there was a huge display of many people involved in showing the evolution theory. Right here's a picture. At the 1904 World's Fair, 2,000 primitive peoples were put on display. The purpose of the display was to demonstrate the superiority of the white Americans who had evolved further. Peter Jennings, liberal Peter Jennings, <laughs> wrote, that, wrote a book and mentioned this in there. And in, if you go to the St. Louis Zoo today, that is on the place where the World's Fair was held, and they're still using some of those same buildings. There in St. Louis at the 1904 World's Fair, they had a man in a cage with chimpanzees to demonstrate the evolution theory. The man was a pygmy from Australia, a pygmy from Africa, a little bitty pygmy, about four foot five, I think he was. Ota Benga was his name. Ota had a wife and two kids. They put him in a cage with chimpanzees. He went insane and killed himself. Why, did, why would they do that to somebody? Well, if you believe in evolution, man's just an animal. Even President Roosevelt, as good a man as he was in many ways, was caught up into this false thinking. Roosevelt thought that the Indians were an inferior species. Roosevelt said, I wish very much the wrong people could be prevented entirely from breeding. Roosevelt thought the immigrants from Europe, Scotland, Ireland, and the Orient were a threat to American society. How many of you have ancestors from one of those places? <laughs> Just about everybody in the room? Yep, you're a threat to American society because you have inferior genes. That's what he thought. In 1871, Congress scrapped all treaties with the Indians and moved them off to the reservation system still in use today. They made promises to the Indians and broke them. After all, they're only savages, they're inferior. The Trail of Tears took place before Darwin's book came out. But still, evolution was very much taught before Darwin's book. Darwin just simply made it popular. But in the Trail of Tears, the Cherokee Indians were moved off their land by force to Oklahoma. About a third of them died along the way. Sam Houston married a Cherokee bride. He was really upset about what's going on with the white people picking on these Indians for no, no reason other than they thought they were an inferior species, which goes right back to the evolution teaching. When they took the Indians out of... Uh, Ross's Landing, Tennessee, they moved the Indians out two weeks before harvest time. They did all the work, planted the crops, tended them all summer long, just before harvest time, came in with soldiers and guns, loaded them into wagons, and moved them out. And of course, the white people moved into their houses, already made, you know, crops ready to harvest, man, pretty nice. So people would forget about what happened, this horrible slaughter of the Indians. They renamed the city. It used to be called Ross's Landing after Chief Ross. Now they call it Chattanooga. Renamed to honor or to make people forget what happened. Here's an article from Franklin College in Franklin, Indiana. The Carnegie Institute of Washington Eugenics Record Office, founded by Mrs. E. H. Harriman. Anybody heard that name before? E. H. Harriman. How many saw Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid? He's getting ready to blow up the train, you know, and he said, I work for Mr. E. H. Harriman. Super rich gazillionaire back in those days. Very much involved in wanting to improve humanity by eliminating the inferior. Carnegie started the organization, <clears throat> now in Berserkley, California, that fights to keep creation out of schools. It's his funding that supplied the start of that organization. The whole idea that man is superior, <laughs> there's a bunch of guys been involved in this. The Bible says, have we not all one father? 
you're not superior because of the color of your skin. The Bible says, He hath made of one blood all nations of men to rule on the earth. Now Darwin thought that a married man was a poor slave worse than a Negro. Regardless, we won't comment on whether it's true or not, but uh, if, <laughs> it's not by the way, but if a professor said that today, how long would he keep his job? Or his life? Some of these feminazis would go kill him, wouldn't they? <laughs> um, and yet they praised Darwin in our school system. Louisiana, I don't know if they got it passed or not, they were working on a bill to ban the teaching of Darwin because of his racism. Very interesting approach. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if our school started teaching the teachings of Adolf Hitler and made it mandatory reading, wouldn't people get upset? Well, why aren't they upset about the mandatory teaching of Darwinism? Hmm? Darwin said, the chief distinction between, of intellectual powers between the two sexes is shown by man's attaining to a higher eminence in whatever he takes up. Whether requiring deep thought, reason, or imagination, or merely the use of the senses and hands, the average mental power in man must be above that of woman. Darwin finally married his first cousin, Emma Wedgwood. Nobody else would take him. Darwin thought men were superior in every single way. Darwin believed in inbreeding, so he married Emma, his first cousin. He wanted to raise a superior stock of children. He ended up having ten children. Mary died shortly after birth. Anne died at ten. Robert was born retarded and died at 19 months. Henrietta had a serious nervous breakdown at 15. Three of his other six sons were ill so often, Charles regarded them as semi-invalids. So much for inbreeding, Charlie. Evolution is the foundation for communism. Communism started by a guy named Karl Marx, removes God from authority and puts man in his place. He says, there is no God, so man must be in charge. Missionaries have said, when they're, when they're working in a country and the communists take over, the first thing the communists do when they come into the country, they go into the schools and they start teaching communism? No. They start teaching evolution. They start by laying a foundation of evolution, and then they bring in the teachings of communism. Communism can't thrive in a place where people believe they've got rights from come, that come from the Creator. And the creation movement in America is one of the biggest hindrances to the advancement of the New World Order. And they very much would like to get rid of guys like me who don't believe in uh, evolution. The guy who founded the ACLU, the American Communist Lawyers Union, or the Anti-Christian Lawyers Union, whatever it is, Roger Baldwin said communism is the goal. You ought to read the history of the founding of the ACLU. One of the purposes of that lawyer's movement was to advance the cause of communism. Karl Marx, whose name, a real name was Moses Mordecai Marx Levy, alias Karl Marx, when he was 17 years old, he wrote a beautiful paper telling how much he loved the Lord. High school graduation, he had a paper saying, man, I want to serve God with my life. Then he went off to college. He studied philosophy and a college professor turned him away from God and turned him on to the teaching of evolution and destroyed Marx's whole philosophy of life. Karl Marx was destroyed by this teaching. You know, 75% of kids from Christian homes that go off to secular schools lose their faith. I meet them by the hundreds all year long. Some college professor destroys their faith. Karl Marx later in life said, my objective in life is to dethrone God and destroy capitalism. Marx based his whole philosophy of communism on the idea of evolution. Karl Marx even tried to dedicate his book to Charles Darwin from a sincere admirer, Karl Marx. Marx knew his theories would not survive without evolution as the foundation philosophy. They go together hand in glove. Karl Marx had six children. Three died of starvation in infancy. Two others committed suicide. When Marx died, only six people attended his funeral. But his philosophy is still ruling one-third of the planet today. You know, one-third of the people on planet Earth are under communism right now. Started by a loser who never worked a day in his life, let his own kids starve to death. He was a loser. Karl Marx developed what we call the Communist Manifesto in 1848. If you want to take over a country, here's how communism works. First thing you do is abolish private property. And by the way, this is the real purpose behind the environmental movement in America. They're not trying to save the environment. Some probably are. But the basic idea behind the movement is abolish private property. You've got to get their permit to cut down your tree. 
That's where it's headed, folks. The Bible talks about private property ownership quite a bit. You know, every 50 years you got your property back. You could not lose it forever. Your family's going to get it back. If you're a loser, you're lazy or whatever, you don't, get, you don't you know, pay your bills and they take it away, your family will get it back every 50th year. The Bible talks about having his own vine and his own fig tree. Drink water out of your own cistern, running waters out of their own well. You know, the solution to pollution in America is private property ownership. Ask anybody that's ever owned a house and rented it out to somebody else. They will understand. Renters don't look at property the same way owners do. How many know what I'm talking about? Okay, there you go. And the more property the government owns, the worse pollution is going to get. Peter Burrell, the president of the National Audubon Society, said, We reject the idea of private property. Well, he's got a good communist philosophy along with Bill Clinton and Hillary. Here's a pledge of allegiance put up at a public school in Massachusetts. Look at this carefully. I pledge allegiance to the earth, which I do love and depend on, and to all life and land, air and sea, which is as much a part of earth as me. At a third grade school in Wisconsin, here's the pledge the kids say. I pledge allegiance to the world, to care for earth, sea and air, to honor every living thing with peace and justice everywhere. Three days ago, I was speaking in Minnesota, and I got to see this young man again who's now grown up, but he told me a couple of years ago, he, Jacob did, he said, Brother Hoven, when I was in third grade at Johnson, Ele, Johnsonville, Johnsville Elementary School in Blaine, Minnesota, his teacher, Ms. Klobhockey, took down the American flag and made the kids pledge to the earth instead. Well, Ms. Klobhockey, I will buy you a one-way ticket to the Soviet Union on the condition you use it and you don't come back. Call me anytime. We'll, I'll buy you one. I've been to communist countries, folks. Trust me, you don't want what they've got. Now, America has lots of problems, I understand. But I love my country, folks. I fear my government, but I love my country. There are basically two philosophies of government. One is based on evolution thinking, which says laws come from man's opinion. How do you decide right from wrong? Oh, man gets together and we decide. Second thing, they say rights are granted by the government. And the government should be the provider. The government provides everything. This is called a democracy. Democracies always become dictatorships. They are horrible forms of government. The government should provide everything. When they were debating about health care here in Pensacola, I heard on the radio you know, several years ago talking about a national health care plan. I thought, did you know 70 to 80 percent of all health care costs are from self-induced problems? Somebody wants to drink or smoke or take drugs, and when they get sick, they want me to pay for it? They were debating on the radio here in one of the WCOA, I think it was, talking about, should we have a national health care plan? I called in. I said, I think it was Luke I got. I said, hey, Luke, I think we should have a, uh, I got an idea here. I forget how I started off. I said, I said, I forgot to change oil in my car, and I blew the engine. I think everybody should help me pay for it. They said, well, if you forgot to change oil and you blew your engine, that's your problem. I said, well, this is exactly the same idea with health care. If you don't want to take care of your health, that, I guess that's your business. But if you get sick, why should I have to pay for it? If you don't want to brush your teeth and floss your teeth, that's oh, you do whatever you want. They're your teeth, but I'm not going to pay you to get you new ones. <laughs> i got to take care of my own too, you know. If we're going to have universal health care, why not universal auto care? If you ever damage your car, the government will pay for it. <laughs> How's that for an idea? How about universal house care? you got a problem with your house, you need new doors, you need new carpet, hey, the government will pay for it. How about the government pay all utility bills? You don't have to yell at your kids anymore. Shut the refrigerator. <coughs> Do you realize what would happen in a hurry? The whole system would crumble. That's what the Canadians are just now trying to figure out. Wow, how come it's costing us so much for this health care? <laughs> I haven't had any health insurance now for 14 years. I take my vitamins. A lot of them. I probably spend 40, 50 bucks a month on vitamins and nutrition for me and my wife. Oh, that's a lot of money. Cheaper than 400 a month for health insurance, isn't it? And boy, when you get sick, it's, it's neat. You go to the hospital, they have to do something, you know, some kind of surgery. I remember one of my boys had surgery, and uh, the house bill was like $4,500, you know, for two hours in, the, in an outpatient place. So I called the different people. I called the anesthesiologist. I said, hello, sir, uh, <clears throat> I noticed your bill here is $1,500 for an hour and a half, you know, putting him to sleep. Uh, I don't have any insurance. I do pay my bills, and I'll pay whatever I have to, but that seems kind of high for an hour and a half, you know. He said, oh, you don't have insurance? Okay, let's make it 300 
just like that over the phone. I called the place, the place that had the room, you know, I'm sure they had to change the sheets and put some new band-aids out and stuff, you know, and I said, listen, I saw your bill here was like, you know, $1,800, that seems kind of high for an hour and a half, you know, for your room. They said, I said, I don't have any insurance. They said, oh, you don't? Okay, let's make it 400 I got the bill down from, I think, 4500 down to about 1000 just over the phone with five phone calls. <laughs> you don't have insurance? Oh, okay. The more people have insurance, the more it raises the price of everything. Now, I'm not against health insurance, okay, but I'm saying the philosophy here is what's important to understand. We got this crazy idea that the government's supposed to provide everything. Well, they'll be glad to do that, but along with that, they're going to take away all your freedoms. Our founding fathers said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. For instance, who gives you the right to have a church? And why do we ask the government for permission? You know, just about every church in America now has become 501c3 corp incorporated because they want to get a government handout. You ought to get the book Hush Money, or the bigger version of it, In Caesar's Grip, by Peter Kershaw, a good friend of mine. You want to find out all the dangers of 501c3 incorporation. The church doesn't have to get incorporated, but if you do get incorporated, you better not preach against certain things from your pulpit. Did you know if you're an incorporated church and you preach against homosexuality, the IRS will pull your tax-exempt status? Churches are tax-exempt anyway. <laughs> what are we asking them that for? Come on. I'll read the book if you want more on that. Patrick Henry said, It cannot be emphasized too strongly that this great nation was founded by Christians, not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, the other philosophy of government is based on creation thinking, which says laws come from the Creator, rights are unalienable, and the government should be limited to the punishment of evildoers and defense, the only two legitimate functions of government. They're not supposed to provide everything for you. You ought to read Davy Crockett's story about, he's out, you know, a house, a neighborhood burned in Washington, D.C. when Davy Crockett was senator or something like that. And the senators got together and said, you know, this whole neighborhood burned. What a horrible tragedy. Everybody lost their house here. Let's vote to give this neighborhood, you know, $50,000, whatever it was way back then, you know, to rebuild their homes. The next fall, Davy Crockett's out stumping, trying to get people to vote for him. And he saw this farmer plowing his field, and he stopped and said, hey, neighbor. The farmer stopped and said, yes, sir, can I help you? He said, I'm Davy Crockett. He said, yes, sir, I know who you are. He said, well, I want to see if you vote for me. The farmer said, no, sir, I'll never vote for you again in my life. He said, well, why not? He said, you broke your trust. He said, I voted for you last time to put you in there to manage things for our, our, our area, and, uh, and you blew it. He said, well, how did I blow it? What did I do? He said, well, you voted to give those people money to rebuild their houses. Crockett said, well, yeah, that was a horrible thing that happened. You know, a big fire swept through the community or something. And the farmer said, are you going to do this for every tragedy across America? What if I lose my crop? What if my cow dies? Are you, what, there's, this is a slippery slope, folks. There's no way out of this one. You have no business to give away our money. Now, if you congressmen want to get together and pool your money and give those folks some money, you go ahead. We've well, entrusted you to manage our money. We've got the whole story. It's amazing. If you call us or email us, we'll send that to you. Davy Crockett said, boy, he learned his lesson. But the senators and representatives today do not understand that lesson. They love giving away your money. Long story on that. A republic, though, is based on the idea that the law is supreme. Our, our government started off to be a constitutional republic, not a democracy. And I get real nervous when I hear them talk about spread democracy around the world. It'd be the dumbest thing we could do. <laughs> talk about a dumb form of government. The second part of Karl Marx's plan was a heavy progressive income tax. Don't get me started on that one, okay? The third thing he said was, abolish the rights of inheritance. The Bible says a good man leaves inheritance to his children's children. Everything about communism is backwards to the biblical plan for things. Second, for, number four, confiscate property rights. Take away the property. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Karl Marx said we need a central bank. He knew full well a central bank could destroy the country. And in 1913, some rich guys got together on Jekyll Island, Georgia, and tricked everybody with the Federal Reserve. Nothing federal about it, and there are no reserves. The Federal Reserve is a private bunch of bankers. Remember, love of money is root of all evil. We've got a whole lot more on that in our college class, CSE 103. Number six, government ownership of communication. That's why we have an FCC, Federal Communication Commission. And government ownership of transportation. That's why we now have the TSA, the Transportation Security Administration. I go to the airports, I flew 175 times last year. I'll break that this year. 
I go to the airport, so there'll be 50 people standing around, you know, to check everything. I went once and they took my fingernail clipper out, this big. It had a little thing that swings out to clean your fingernails. They said, oh, can't have that. They broke it off. <laughs> You've got to be kidding. I'm going to take over a plane with a fingernail clipper. <laughs> They're paranoid. Number seven, government ownership of factories and agriculture. Number eight, government control of labor. Number nine, corporate farms and regional planning. Number ten, free education. You know the public school idea came from Karl Marx? Now, there were public schools before that, I understand, but Karl Marx said the government should do free education for everybody. Well, my PhD is in education. My mom taught for years and retired. My brother's in his 34th year now teaching public school. I speak in hundreds and hundreds of schools across the world. Folks, I'm for education, but I'm dead set against government involvement in education. The government's got no business being involved in education at all. You better read your Constitution, the Tenth Amendment. Unless that's spelled out in that document, the government shouldn't do it. We've gotten a long ways away from that. Hitler said, you let me control the textbooks, I'll control the state. Martin Luther said, I am much afraid that the schools will prove to be the great gates to hell unless they diligently labor in explaining the scriptures, engraving them in the hearts of youth. He said, I would advise no one to place his child where the scriptures do not reign paramount. Every institution <clears throat> in which men are not unceasingly, increasingly occupied with the word of God must become corrupt. Well, go walk the halls of the schools, folks. I'm telling you, they have become corrupt. Here's a 1777 public school book, first grade. Here's what they taught the kids in first grade in America. Used in public, private schools. It's a first grade textbook. Here's how they learned the alphabet. In Adam's fall, we sinned all. Back then they made the S like a letter F, okay? Heaven to find the Bible mind. Christ crucified for sinners died. The deluge drowned the earth around. Elijah hid, the ravens fed. The judgment made Felix afraid. Public school textbook. Interesting. Here's how the youth, young people, learned their alphabet. A wise son maketh a glad father. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Come unto, the, unto Christ, all ye that labor and heavy laden. Do not the abominable thing which I hate, saith the Lord. That's a public school textbook, folks. Guess what they teach the kids today? You're an animal. Share a common heritage with earthworms. Here's a textbook that has over 100 pages devoted to evolution theory. Not one mention of creation or God any place in the book. Not one. What has happened, folks? The United Nations has already declared. They had a world declaration on education for all in 1990. Called for the nations of the world to adopt a common education system complete with implementation timetables and recommended curriculum. In our own nation, Goals 2000, School to Work, and the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, Profiles of Learning, are totally consistent with the One World Government recommendations of the 1990 UN Declaration. You ought to get hold of Bob Fry in Minnesota. We'll put his address up here and you can call Bob about more stuff on the... He's very involved in fighting this type of thing right here. A humanist said in the Humanist Magazine, uh, John Dunfrey said, the battle for mankind's future must be waged in one in the public school classroom by teachers who correctly perceive their roles as proselytizers of a new faith that will replace the rotting corpse of Christianity. This guy said, every child who enters school at age five is mentally ill because he comes to school with allegiance toward our elected officials, founding fathers, institutions, government, patriotism, nationalism, sovereignty. All these prove the child is sick because the Welch individual is one who has rejected all those things and is what I call the true international child communist of the future. Dr. Pierce from Harvard University. Well, Dr. Pierce, I'll buy you a one-way ticket also to the Soviet Union if you use it and don't come back. I've been over there, folks. You don't want what they've got. There's a social science book, public school book. They said any child who believes in God is mentally ill. Education is the most powerful ally of humanism, and every American public school is a school of humanism. What can the theistic Sunday school, meeting for an hour once a week, and teaching only a fraction of the children, do to stem the tide of a five-day program of humanistic teaching. They're right, folks, and they're winning. We're losing. One professor said, as a matter of fact, creationism should be discriminated against. No advocate of such propaganda should be trusted to teach science classes or administer science programs anywhere, under any circumstances. Moreover, if they are now doing so, they should be dismissed. You should fire them if they believe in creation. 
An Iowa professor said, you should fail any student, no matter what the grade record indicate, if the professor discovers the student is a creationist. Furthermore, the student's department should have the right of retracting the grades and possibly even degrees if the student becomes a creationist later. That's the kind of thinking we're up against. Mr. Yefremov lives here in Pensacola. He came to my house several years ago. He's from Ukraine. He said, Dr. Hoven, here's my high school diploma. I said, yeah. You know, you're 50 years old. You got five kids, a couple of, you know, four in college. Uh, why are you handing me your high school diploma? <laughs> he said, when I was in Ukraine, I went to school, had good grades. They grade them one, two, three, four, five. Five's the best. He said, showed me his report card, all fives, like straight A's. He said, but we had a test to take before we could graduate. Senior year in high school, one of the questions on the test was, do you believe in evolution? I answered, no. They refused to let me graduate. I said, well, how'd you get the diploma? He said, oh, you remember last year when we made your videotapes in Russian and he did the voice on them? I said, yeah. He said, I sent them to my village where I grew up in Russia. The mayor watched them, made all the city council watch the tapes. And they said, wow, Eugene went to America and became a movie star. <laughs> they put him in the public school to make all the public school kids watch him. The kid who was there, uh, the, the, the guy who refused to let him get his diploma 35 years ago, had now become a city councilman. And the mayor said, oh, go ahead and send him his diploma. Okay, yes, sir. He said, I just got my diploma in the mail. What do you think, Brother Hoven? I said, wow. <laughs> what a story. See, the humanists have decided years ago they're going to use the education system to spread their evolution in humanism because that way we pay for it. We're paying to spread their religion. That's what's going on, folks. Communism is anti-Christian in every single way. The communists have eight rules for revolution, different ways, there are different things they want to do to take over a country. We don't have time to go over them all now. I have to cover that some other time. Or get our college class, CSE 103, where we cover this in much more detail. Evolution is the foundation philosophy for Nazism. Why did Hitler do what he did? Well, we'll cover that tomorrow night. It's the foundation for Nazism, communism, socialism, Marxism, and the New World Order. Coming soon. We'll talk about that tomorrow night. Very politically incorrect. You don't want to come tomorrow. And then we'll tell you what you can do about it. Amen. Coming next. Well, welcome to the last session on our, what's on our videotape number five about the effects of the evolution theory. How that evolution is responsible for the rise of communism, Marxism, socialism. And tonight we're going to talk about Nazism, the last one, and then the New World Order. Then we're going to tell you what do you do about it. Our world is quite obviously falling apart. What are we going to do? Nazism is based on the philosophy of evolution. You have to think one race is superior to another. Uh, Mussolini, the Italian dictator, thought that the Italians were the superior race and everybody else should be eliminated. Of course, Hitler felt the same way. He thought the Germans were the superior race. He believed in Aryan supremacy. Hitler believed the Germans were the superior race that deserved to rule the world. Everybody else was just taking up room. The German Fuhrer consistently sought to make the practice of Germany conform to the theory of evolution. This fellow said a direct line runs from Darwin through the father of eugenics movement, Darwin's cousin Francis Galton, to the extermination camps of Nazi Europe. Exactly right. In Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, you can read his racist philosophy. It just kind of oozes off every page. Adolf Hitler's mind was captivated by evolutionary thinking, probably since he was a boy. Evolutionary ideas lie at the basis of all that is worst in Mein Kampf and in his speeches. Hitler offered to send the Jews to anybody who would take them. He said, you want these Jews? I'll send them to you. I read a lot about Hitler and the Holocaust. You ought to read the book, While Six Million Died, and see what the rest of the world did. Did you know Hitler offered to send the Jews to America and Roosevelt refused to let him? Unbelievable what happened, folks, during World War, before World War II. In Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, on page 286 in this edition, he said, even less does nature desire the blending of a higher with a lower race. Who's a higher and a lower race, Adolf? Hitler kept talking about the Aryan blood and lower peoples. Well, who's an Aryan anyway? Well, I found Hitler's hit list. I was reading in University, uh, Keene State University, New Hampshire. I was doing some research in their library there one time. And I found, uh, they got a whole section of the library just about Hitler and the Holocaust. I thought, wow, I was in hog heaven. So I asked the librarian, why did Hitler kill the Jews? Why not somebody else? He said, oh, I'll show you the list he was using. 
He brought me book after book after book for six hours. I copied $20 worth of pages, 10 cents at a time, out of that library. Here's the list Hitler was using. Hitler thought the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Nordic were close to pure Aryan, the superior race. Did you get all that? Blonde hair, blue-eyed, Norwegian, born and started till he died. Yeah, sure, you betcha. Oofta. And he thought the Germans were mostly Aryan. The Mediterraneans are slightly Aryan. The Slavics are half Aryan, half ape. The Orientals are slightly ape. The black Africans are predominantly ape, and the Jews are close to pure ape. Hitler killed the Jews because he honestly thought he was speeding up the process of evolution by eliminating what he thought were the inferiors. If he would have killed all the Jews, guess who would have been next? Blacks. Hitler hated black people. Does anybody know where the Olympics were held in uh, 1936? Berlin, Germany. Uh, does anybody know who won the most gold medals? Jesse Owens, the black American athlete. Hitler was so angry, he said, it's not fair to make my men race against this animal. One of the Jewish prisoners who survived the Holocaust said, There is a difference between those who look upon their fellow human beings as common creatures of a common creator and those who look upon them of a conglomerate of biologicals and chemicals. Hey, is man just a bunch of chemicals that got together by chance over billions of years, or were we designed by a creator? That is a fundamental difference, folks. So that's the difference between creation and evolution right there. By the way, the Jewish Talmud, not the Torah, which is the Old Testament, the Talmud, teaches that anybody who's not Jewish should be killed. It says the Talmud says all non-Jews are to be exterminated. All Gentile children are animals. Even the best of the Gentiles should be killed. You'd be surprised how many religions in the world teach that they are the only one, not just the only one that's going to heaven, but the only one that deserves to live. You ought to read the, what the Muslims teach. You know, official Muslim doctrine is, according to Islam, you can read about the, the prophet, a great little book here if you want to read about how the, the start of the Muslim church, or about who is this Allah anyway. These are books we offer in our ministry. You can get these through our bookstore downtown here. Or Islamic Invasion by Robert Morey. Oh man, tremendous book on exposing what the Islam people really believe. Or this one just new out by Don Boys. Excellent book on Islam, America's Trojan Horse. Did you know the Torah, I mean not the Torah, the Koran clearly teaches if a person will not convert, they, should, they have to be executed. Here's the Koran uh, in Surah 489. Allah commands that any person who leaves Islam or encourages others to do so should be seized and slain. Allah told Muhammad that all, his, all those who opposed his message should be killed, or they should be nailed to a tree, or their hands and legs should be cut off. You cannot be a good Muslim without being a revolutionary. You have to hate everybody that isn't Muslim. I feel sorry for the folks that are duped by that silly idea. They need the gospel. We need to get, try to get it to them. Okay? Maybe God's brought a bunch of them to America so we can win them to the Lord. But what Hitler did with his concentration camps and killing the Jews, I don't think it's possible to understand what Hitler did and why he did it until you see how evolution ties in. Hitler thought he was speeding up the process and doing the world a favor by getting rid of the inferior genes. He killed at least six million. I've been to Germany three times. I read lots of books about Hitler and the Holocaust just to keep my blood boiling. What Hitler did was a direct result of his belief in evolution. See, what you believe determines how you behave. He was just speeding up the process. Hitler held his rallies at Nuremberg. I stood on the spot where Hitler spoke all of his uh, rallies there in Nuremberg on that uh, granite mined out of Flossburg camp where I just had been a few hours earlier where all the Jews died trying to mine granite for Hitler's platform to stand on. Hitler tried to make the people look small. The individual is small, and the cause was great. Had these massive rallies at the Nuremberg uh, arena there. You know, the new... The, Environmental movement folks try to do the same thing. They try to make the individual look small and the cause look great. You know, people are expendable. We've got to save Mother Earth. <laughs> Doing the same thing with our kids today. Hitler knew full well you have to indoctrinate the young people. And the evolutionists have worked very hard to infiltrate our school system and thoroughly indoctrinate the young people. It's interesting. Hitler referred to the Jews as parasites in the body of nations. The abortionists refer to the unborn child as a parasite in the woman's body. Same language. Hitler, one of his justifications for uh, believing in evolution was the gill slits. We talk about that on video four, the idea that the embryo has gills made up by the German professor Ernst Haeckel. And that goes on, we can talk a lot more about that on get our video number four about how uh, abortion is murder based on the thinking that evolution is true. It's a crazy idea. Hitler said, this new state, Germany, will give its youth to no one. We're going to raise the youth the way we want them to be raised. There was a man in Skokie, Illinois, that shot and killed a doctor when they asked him, why did you kill this doctor? 
He said, because he's making blue-tinted contact lenses for people and he's diluting the Aryan beauty. Folks, the Aryan supremacy idea is not dead. There are still white supremacists all over the country. And I know I'm in the South. <laughs> well, get over it, okay? Nobody's better because of the color of their skin. Hitler tried to hide behind the idea that Christianity justified what he was doing. This excellent book by Marvin Lutzer at uh, Moody Bible Press on Hitler's cross about how he tried to make people think it's okay because God had told him to kill all these people. Hitler, one of his propaganda pictures showed him walking out of a church with a cross over his head. He was a liar. Do you know they had Nazi baptisms? Hitler secretly, though, hated Christianity. He said, I regard Christianity as the most fatal seductive lie that ever existed because Christianity teaches all nations are of one blood. You're not better than anybody because of the color of your skin. That's what Christianity teaches. But they had Nazi baptisms, Nazi altars. Just unreal what Hitler did, trying to hide behind the guise of Christianity. Now, the Japanese also thought that they were a superior race. The Japanese textbooks taught their kids for 30 or 40 years. When, when, when Darwin's book came out in 1859, when it was translated to Japanese several years later, the Japanese bought it up like crazy and said, wow, this is a perfect theory. They sucked it right in because it goes right along with the religions they already had there in Japan. And they said, wow, one race is superior. I bet it's the Japanese. They had special studies where they studied people and they said the Japanese don't have as much hair on their body, which proves they've ascended further from the apes. And they said they have a mild, milder body odor and they were the superior race that deserved to rule the world. People say, when I, when I say, I think evolution is largely responsible for World War II, they look at me like I'm nuts. But folks, that's exactly the case. Evolution is also the foundation philosophy for the New World Order. We cover lots on this on our college class, uh, CSE 103, where my 17-hour seminar is stretched out to 60 hours, where we chased every rabbit and kicked every dog that walked by. <laughs> that's a whole lot of stuff on our college course there. The United Nations has plans for a one-world government. The United Nations wants to establish a UN military force that can intervene in inter internal events in any country. They want to eliminate the veto power of the United States. They want to give the UN jurisdiction over the Earth Commons. That means the United Nations decides who owns, you know, the rivers and everything, everything in Earth. This is from a speech given by the Secretary General in September of 2000. They've already divided up the world into ten regions. You know, for years I was taught the European Roman, the old Roman Empire is going to be revived in the last days, and we're going to have the ten, you know, the, the vision in the book of Daniel. Ten kings are going to get together and give their power to one king. And then I think we've been maybe missing something here, brother. Maybe it's not ten countries in Europe going to unite. Maybe it's ten regions of the world. Maybe this last vision of Daniel was the whole world uniting. They are making plans for a new world order. There are some extremely wealthy, powerful people making plans to rule the world, like Pinky and the Brain. <laughs> They're out there trying to take over the planet, and God's up in heaven laughing about it. Psalms chapter 2, the psalmist said, Why do the heathen rage? The people imagine vain things. The kings of the earth set themselves. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against His anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. God sees all their plans for a one-world government, and He's laughing about it. Now, in the meantime, I think we're going to have to go through, through some really hard times down here, folks. People say, well, God's going to get us out of here before the tribulation. Oh, tell that to the Chinese Christians, and the Russian Christians, and the Egyptian Christians that have been killed here, and those in Sudan, where they've killed hundreds of thousands in Africa just because they're Christians, just in the last 10 or 15 years. Boy, if any country ever deserved the judgment of God, it's America. Amen. And I think it's coming soon to a city near you. The United Nations has plans to tax the world. They want to, we'll be paying a tax if they have their way, to the United Nations. They want to get the UN authority to regulate international commerce. They want to control food. They understand full well that the production and distribution of food is the way to control the world. United Nations has plans to establish a new seat of power in the UN called the People's Assembly. It'll consist of representatives from nations, but also representatives from non-government organizations. Just organizations can be, have a seat in there. Interesting. They want to have jurisdiction over all, non, over all nation states. They certainly want to have jurisdiction over all the churches. And many churches have already stuck their head in the noose by becoming incorporated. And they don't realize what they've done. There's a good book if you want to read more on that. You can get it from our website, right 
or right here in our bookstore in Caesar's Grip about how the incorporation process, 501c3, has trapped churches where they cannot speak out on certain topics. Man, 100 years ago, the politicians were scared stiff of the pastors because they just get up there and preach, you know, Senator Jones is a whoremonger. <laughs> well, today, if you talk about politics, they'll jerk your 501c3 status. And so Christians say, well, we can't talk about certain topics in the pulpit. Well, then you're not serving God. Right. If you're a prophet of God, you, tell, you say what God told you to say. If it hair lips the devil, then tough. <laughs> it goes back to the two basic philosophies of government. You know, evolution based on man's opinion and creation based on laws come from the Creator. He gives us rights to have churches. He gives us rights to speak, our, to speak the truth. Our founding father said, when it comes in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the bands which have connected them to another. They said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator with certain rights. They kept talking about the right of the people because of the fact they were created by God. When you get a bunch of people together who believe they were created, they don't make good slaves. They're going to throw the tea in the harbor and start a big war. And so the guys who would like a new world order are fighting very hard to not let creation into the schools because the schools are their primary method of teaching their evolution theory, which says rights come from government, not from God. This fellow said, fundamentalists have no, fundamentalist parents have no right to indoctrinate their children in their beliefs. We are preparing their children for the year 2000 in life in a global one world society and those children will not fit in. They want to prepare our kids for a new world order and boy, it's working folks. 75% of kids from Christian homes that go to secular schools lose their faith after one year of college. There's a great book called The Medusa File by Craig Roberts, excellent book on the government cover-ups of all sorts of things that have been covered up. Did you know how many prisoners of war were left behind when we fought World War II and when we fought in the Japanese theater and when we fought Vietnam? Those prisoners of war were taken off to be um, coal miners up in the Soviet Union and in China. They just disappeared into slave labor camps. And some leaders in our government knew about it and said, oh, it's not worth messing with, just let them go. There are some still alive over there. Read this book, The Medusa File, if you want to get more on that. If you want to understand the conspiracy that's right now Satan is using to control the world, there are so many good books you can read about this. I've got several on the table here. There are different groups with their smoke-filled rooms trying to control the world. There's a meeting, <coughs> there's a committee, of uh, 300 Jewish financiers, all masters of lodges, who rule the world according to Protocols of Zion. Now I get crit criticized for recommending the Protocols of Zion. I understand the book was written so that it would, if it was found, it would be blamed on the Jews. It's actually the bankers. But they kept calling it, they said, write, wrote it as if the Jews are going to do this and the Jews are going to do that. I tell you what, you read it, it's all, come, it's all come true in the last hundred years. And people say, that's a bad book, Brother Hovind. Well, yeah, it is, but it, it reveals their plan for the world, but it was not written by Jews, it was written by financiers, money lenders, with, and shows their plan to rule the world. There's a book called The Committee of 300, showing the 300 top people who really make the decisions on this planet to decide when we're going to have a war and when we're going to have a depression and a recession. You get more on that. See, a lot of these crises that we face are man-made, intentionally made. I don't know if you saw the video of the airplane flying into the Twin Towers, but there's a video on the internet you can watch showing an F-15 flying right beside it, guiding them into the Twin Towers. You gotta, they slow the tape down and show it frame by frame. Interesting. I'm not sure what all happened that day, folks. I'm not sure if anybody's sure what all happened that day. But they will develop a crisis just so they can get their goals accomplished. Some of these guys would like a new world order, a one world government, and they're not against killing three or 4,000 people if it helps their cause like blow up the Oklahoma City building just so we can, you know, eliminate the militia groups that are getting a little out of hand, you know? Or just so we can get more homeland security measures. I can't even carry my pocket knife on the plane now. <laughs> well, the Civil War was deliberately done in order to get more toward a one world government. So was World War I. The 1929 Depression was deliberately caused to get people to come in and get a social security number, which, by the way, is a voluntary system. The Cuban Missile Crisis was deliberate. See, the, the Russians, they have a technique. They say, we'll take two steps forward and one step back, and everybody thinks we retreated. They wanted a missile base. They wanted a military base in Cuba. So they put in a military base and missiles. Kennedy huffed and puffed about the missiles, you know, the big missile crisis in 62, and they took the missiles out, we think. 
and left the military base. Two steps forward, one step back, they're further toward the goal. They've done that all over the world. Oklahoma City was blown up by apparently some terrorists, obviously, but it wasn't the truck bomb in the street that blew that building up, folks. There's a whole lot more to it than that. You want to get a hold of Ben Parton, the Air Force uh, general in charge of explosives. He said, I know what blows buildings up. I've been doing this for 30 years. He said a truck bomb did not blow up that building. There were bombs in the basement around the pillars, sheared the pillars off. Talk to Ben Pardon. There's his phone number right there. If you don't believe me, he got a great videotape about that. In order to get anti-terrorism legislation passed that had been stalled in Congress, that's why I think those buildings came down. The TWA bombing was done deliberately to get rid of some people who were going to go testify against Bill Clinton, apparently. <clears throat> There's been so many conspiracies, and I read all this stuff and listen to all these things and see, read lots of books on it, but folks, it doesn't matter in a bigger sense. I think we as Christians need to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. I'm going to share with you tonight what I think the solution is. What, what should we be doing in light of the fact that there's a new world order coming down upon us and Christians are not going to be welcome? This fellow said, we're on the verge of a global transformation. All we need is the right major crisis and the nations will accept the new world order. I tell you what, when they're bombing your cities, every, people will give up their rights in order for safety. I think it was Ben Franklin said, those who will give up their rights for peace and security will have neither peace nor security. The <clears throat> Bible says, this know also in the last days perilous times shall come. Folks, there are bad times coming. I'm not going to get up here and say, everything's going to be fine. I feel like something good's about to happen to you. <laughs> I feel like something bad's about to happen to everything. Okay, get ready. I got two grandkids, more coming. I'm just, I'm not excited about bad times coming, but folks, it's coming. What they do, they think of some excuse to create a crisis so the president can declare martial law, which of course sets aside the Constitution. Presidents are now actually ruling by executive order. There have been 13,000 of these given. Abraham Lincoln gave the first one ever in America, ordering 75,000 troops to invade the South. As it was Lincoln's War, not the Civil War. Another long story on that one. We covered that on seminar on a uh, college class, CSE 103. What they'll do, these rich folks will get in their mind what they want to accomplish, and how to get more control over the world, and then they, they develop a crisis to get people to do what they want. They are laying plans for a one world government. And now the presidents, ruling by executive orders, have totally bypassed the Constitution. We could talk for hours on the executive orders. I've got a list of quite a few of them here. In case of an emergency, though, they have the authority to take over all food supplies, take over all vehicles. If your vehicle is state registered, they can come take it if they want it. Commandeer your vehicle. They can take away all the American people for workforces. They have to take over all the health, education, and welfare facilities. Take over all the airports. Register all men and women for the draft. Force relocation centers. Take over all the railroads, inland waterways, storage facilities. FEMA is going to provide the muscle to do this. The Federal Emergency Management Act. Those are the guys to watch, the ones that make me real nervous. They're going to be the enforcers. See, no dictator can really do anything without somebody to enforce his will on the people. Hitler never shot anybody, but people did. On March 17, 2003, George Bush told the Iraqi soldiers to disobey if they're given orders to use poison gas or set the wells on fire, didn't he? How many heard that? He said, you guys are going to be judged as war criminals if you do these things after we win. Want to listen carefully. Soldiers, some of you are in the military here. You took an oath to defend the Constitution against enemies foreign and domestic. Is that right? What if the domestic enemy is your boss? Who's your authority to? Who's your elite? Is it to God? It's going to be a tough time for Christian soldiers. They're going to have to make a decision to stand up and say, okay, I'm going to do what God says. Sometimes there are conflicts between authorities. Kids know this. They try to get mom to say one thing and dad to say another. Try to create a conflict in the authority chain, right? Kids are good at that. Well, God's the ultimate authority. And if I was a soldier, I would serve my country and I would obey orders until there was an order to disobey something God had said to do. That's where you draw the line. I'm sorry, I just simply can't do that, sir. I refuse. You say, they're going to court martial me. Oh, so money's more important than uh, God's will, huh? <laughs> That's what it boils down to. That sometimes it is always right to disobey evil orders. Many of you took an oath to defend this Constitution. Now, do it. Tyrants cannot succeed without enforcers. Hitler never shot anybody. He told people to do it, and they did it for him. Okay, who's doing all this, and why, and what are we supposed to do about it? 
There are many people involved in the plans for the new world order. We have the United Nations. We have the World Council of Churches. We have the Council of Foreign Relations. You want to get more on that? You'd want to read the, And a lot of these books are referenced on my website where you can get more information on these books that are, uh, if you want to go down deep on these topics. There's the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderbergers, the International Monetary Fund, IMF, the International Bankers, the Club of Rome, the Communists, the Socialists, the National Education Association, NEA, very much involved. And by the way, teachers, if you're a teacher in a public school, get out of the NEA. Quit paying them your dues. Don't support them. You should read the stuff that they support and that they're for. If you're a Christian and you love God and you're a public school teacher, quit the NEA. You say, but I won't get insurance. There are other places to get insurance, for one thing. Number two, money doesn't dictate right and wrong. If it does, you got a problem. <laughs> you do what's right. God takes care of it from there. Okay? Get out of that place. Get out of that club. Okay? The NOW, National Organization for Wild Women. The ACLU, the American Communist Lawyers Union. Uh, the Masonic Lodge. I had a guy in our church came to me and said, Brother Hovind, I've been in the Masonic Lodge for years. I don't see anything wrong with it. I said, Brother, would you go home and read this book, Masonry Beyond the Light? Just read this book. Bring it back and we'll talk. He brought it back two weeks later and said, well, I quit the lodge and I've got four of my other brothers to quit the lodge also, brother. Thank you so much for giving me that book. Most of the guys that I know in the Masonic Lodge, including some very close friends of mine, don't really have a clue what they're in. They don't realize until they get to the top. It's a satanic organization. I'll show you. Here's the oath. Uh, or General Pike said, that which we must say to the crowd is, we worship a God, but it's a God that one adores without superstition. To you, sovereign grand inspectors general, we say this, that you may repeat it to the 32nd, 31st, and 30th degrees. The Masonic religion should be, by all of us initiates of the higher degrees, maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. Less, yes, Lucifer is God. When the Mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands. And before he may step onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly handle energy. You can read Scarlet and the Beast if you want to go down real deep on the Masonic Lodge, or this one, Beyond the Light. You can get it from Chick Publications or call our office. We can get you one. The Bible says we're not supposed to swear at all, right? Have you read the Masonic Oath that they swear? This is just the first one. They go through many oaths in this process. They say, I, to put their name in there, do hereby swear that I will always conceal and never reveal any of the secrets of Freemasonry to any person. If I do, I consent to having my throat cut from ear to ear, my tongue torn out by the roots, my berry, body buried in the sands of the sea at low water mark. Can you imagine Jesus saying something like that? Have we gone nuts? The Bible says, swear not at all. Get out of that club. Just quit, okay? Quit supporting them. If you get all that free time on your hands, go do something around the church. Go win somebody to Christ. Amen. Jesus said, I've done nothing in secret. Why do they have their secret clubs, their secret handshakes, you know, where you hold the second knuckle, depending on what degree you're in, all these different secret handshakes, you know, and the secret way that they stand, you know, judge, they put their hand like this, I'm in distress, you know, rescue me, judge. You know, the judge is probably a mason too. Or like this, you know. That's a sign of ultimate distress. You've got to rescue me. Every mason's obligated if they got their hands like this, making part of a square. Joseph Smith, the leader of the Mormon, uh, Mormon church, when he was being shot outside the Carthage jail, did like this, hoping there were some Masons in the crowd. I had two Mormon, or about six Mormon missionaries, I guess, lived down the street from me in California. I went there to visit them one time to their house, trying to win them to the Lord. I will witness them to them, brother. And I got there kind of early in the morning, I guess, for them, 10 o'clock. I thought it was not too early, but they had their holy underwear on. <laughs> I'd never seen it. I'd heard about it, but I'd never seen it before. They come to the door. Got their holy underwear. It's got a Masonic Lodge symbol over each nipple and one on each on the thigh. They're not allowed to ever have all the underwear off at the same time because the demons can get them. So when they take a shower, they leave their underwear on one leg, take a shower on half their body, put it on the other leg, and take a shower on the other half of their body. Talk about dumb. <laughs> it's not holy underwear, okay? You should see how Joseph Smith went just near to the top of the Masonic Lodge in one day. The Mormons and the Masons are all tied in together, folks. February 2nd, 33rd day of the year, by the way, is the first high day of the Satanic churches. 1933, by the way, call it Groundhog Day. Do it over and over and over till you get it right. Maybe you saw the movie Groundhog, right? 1933, Roosevelt passed the War Powers Act. He ordered all private gold turned into the government. 
Rockefeller helped set up Adolf Hitler in 1933, financed Adolf Hitler to come to power because we needed another war so Rockefeller could make some more money. These guys make money off these wars, folks. We could talk a long time about the Masons and their tie into this, but just get our videotape, uh, uh, for CSE 103. There are so many good books you can read about what's going on. Uh, uh, en Route to Global Occupation by Gary Ka, excellent book. The New World Order by William Still, who writes a lot on the Federal Reserve also. Tremendous book. Angels Don't Play This Harp, about the harp technology, High Altitude Aurora Research Project, how they're using microwaves to bounce them off the clouds of the uh, uh, high altitude uh, atmosphere and create virtual lenses and steer weather, direct weather patterns. You know, make a country have a famine just by using High Altitude Aurora Research Project. You can read up on that. Uh, we could talk all night about that, but uh, just see our website. We've got a whole list of recommended books if you want to read more. Satan is the one who's deceiving the world. Right. These individual people are not the enemy. God loves them and they can be saved. Anybody can be forgiven for their sin. But there's a battle coming, folks. Satan's been working hard to get people to work for him. And there are now military forces that it'd be pretty hard to uh, fight against. The Bible says, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? The New World Order folks have a goal to reduce the population to one half billion as soon as possible. You watch. I think it'll happen in the next, who knows, in my lifetime for sure, probably in the next few years. We're going to see the population of the earth radically reduced through whatever means, vaccines, wars, pestilence, famine, just like the Bible predicted. Read Revelation, it's all in there. Wooster said, people are the cause of all the problems. We need to get rid of some of them. Jacques Cousteau said, we need to eliminate 350,000 people today to save Mother Earth. Ted Turner said, we need a 95% decline in population. Okay, Ted, you first. <laughs> Bill Clinton signed the Biodiversity Treaty, which said we need to reduce the human population to one billion. Well, Bill, you, a lot of folks wouldn't miss you. Go ahead, man. Prince Philip, the husband of Queen Elizabeth, she's the one that invented the microwave. You'll get that later. Prince Philip said, if I could be reincarnated, I would wish to return to Earth as a killer virus to lower human population levels. I think they're going to put viruses in the vaccines and give them to these third world countries and wipe them out. I think it's already been doing, or already been going on. Okay, what do we do? The world's a mess. We're going to see the end of it. It's going to get really bad really soon. What do we do? We should do exactly what Jesus told us to do 2,000 years ago. He said, go ye into all the world, teach, them, teach all nations, baptize them, get them saved, and then teach them to go do the same thing. You know, Jesus lived under Roman control. So, go win, go win souls. The Bible says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We need to know what to do. Today what we need are some men and women of understanding to tell us what to do. In the book of Proverbs it says, By a man of understanding and knowledge the state thereof shall be prolonged. We need somebody who understands what to do. The Bible says in Deuteronomy, Take wise men and understanding and known among the tribes, and I will make them rulers over you. Solomon said, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart, that I may judge, discern between good and bad. The Bible says Abigail was a woman of good understanding. And beautiful, that don't hurt, you know, but she was, she was good understanding, okay? She knew what to do. In the book of Ezra, it says they sent for all these guys, you know, Eliezer and etc., men of understanding. By the good hand of our God upon us, they brought us a man of understanding. The men of Issachar were men of understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. We need some pastors to be men of understanding to know what they ought to do. We need some dads to understand what's going on and understand what you ought to do with your family. Dads, that's your family. You're, you're going to be stand before God one of these days and be judged for how they turn out. Take command of the situation. People say, oh, my kids won't obey. Are you feeding them still? Are you clothing them? Are you giving them a place to, place to sleep? Hey, if they're going to sleep under my roof and eat my food, they're going to do what I say. Amen. Period. <laughs> okay. My three kids all turned out serving the Lord, all working for me in my ministry. Now, they're not perfect by a long shot, but they can tell you, boy, when Dad said it, he meant it. <laughs> this is the way it's going to be, son. You're not going to do that in my house. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> I'm paying the bills. You know, as soon as you want to take over the bills, then you can take over the control. Meanwhile, shut your mouth. <laughs> I think it's time to get motivated, folks. 
There's a real serious problem coming, looming on the horizon. We're going to see real serious trouble in America. What do we do? Well, the first mention of Caesar in the Bible is in Matthew 22, 17. Tell us, therefore, what thou thinkest. Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Hmm. Jesus was born under Caesar's control. What did he do? He ignored them. Just go win souls. So Twelve things we need to do. Number one, you need to realize God's in control. He's the potter. We are the clay. Shut up. Sit still. Let him do something with you. Amen. Okay. Be still and know that he is God. Let him put you where he wants you and make out of you what he wants, whatever he wants to make out of you. He's the potter. Number two, be wise as serpents. I think we stick our head in a lot of nooses and let them hang us. And we could talk a long time about all the different ways that we have created a nexus of relationship with the government. Churches do that by getting 501c3. People do that by getting marriage licenses and driver's licenses and social security numbers and on and on and on. We cover all that on our CSE class 103. Number three, be careful for nothing. Careful means full of care. I see people that are worried and nervous. Wow, what's going to happen? The New World Order's coming. They're going to come kill everybody. Well, go, go win some souls. <laughs> Number four, pray for those in authority. We're his children. Obey his orders. Preach the gospel. Be the salt of the earth. Salt irritates. Some of these Christians are so worried about offending somebody. <laughs> Who cares? I want to please God. Nothing else is going to matter, folks. Use your influence. Everybody has influence. Some of you ought to get on the school board. I hear people say, well, Christians shouldn't got to get involved in politics. Oh, tell that to King David, King Solomon. <laughs> Daniel, he was involved in politics. I mean, read your Bible. Of course we ought to get involved, right? We need to teach the truth about creation. You know, in Acts chapter 17, there are only two great sermons in the book of Acts. Acts 2, Peter preached on Pentecost, spoke in one language. They heard him in 17 languages, an amazing miracle. And... He spoke, and he quoted verse after verse after verse. The Jews were familiar with Bible verses. But in Acts 17, Paul preached on Mars Hill to the heathen. He didn't quote one Bible verse. Imagine preaching a whole sermon without one Bible verse. He just said, God that made the world. He talked about creation. And folks, if we're going to reach America, it's going to have to be using the creation message to reach them. The textbooks are teaching the evolution story. Textbooks in Escambia County, right here, are teaching the kids the evolution story. They learned it today. They're going to learn it again tomorrow. This textbook says, Life arose from non-living matter present on the early earth. Does that agree with what the Bible says? No. Did we pay for that to go in the classrooms in this town? Yes. <laughs> Doesn't that bother anybody? Oh, the earth is 4.5 billion years old. The oldest fossils are 3.5 billion years old. Eukaryotes evolved from prokaryotes about one and a half billion years ago. They just teach it like it's a fact, folks. There's a war going on. Get involved. Do something. If a kid goes to 12 to 16 years to school in this town with, what, over 200 churches in Pensacola, how's he going to view the world? Well, if he believes what he's taught in the textbook, he's going to believe in evolution. Number nine, don't get distracted. Satan's a master at distracting us on absolutely dumb things that don't matter. How many have seen a mobile? You put it over the crib and you wind it up, and the kid lays there and he goes, oh. <laughs> We get distracted so easily. Average American watches 1,500 hours of TV a year. That's enough time to read your Bible 22 times. Now, I don't think you ought to sit around and read the Bible all the day long, you know, but you ought to read it some. The Bible said, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Do you put wicked things in front of your eyes? Folks, we're wicked. That's why we got all this government bureaucracy over us. The Bible says, for the transgressions of the land, many are the princes thereof. That's why we got all these bureau bureaucrats, <laughs> because we're wicked. The Bible says, righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Now, here's the solution right here. God told Solomon, if my people which are called by my name, shall vote Republican, start a militia, store up revival, I mean, store up survival foods. Is that what he said? No. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. Hey, dads, 
When's the last time your kids saw you humble yourself? When's the last time they saw you at the altar praying for somebody? When's the last time they saw you crying for lost souls? When's the last time they saw you fast and pray to, in order to get somebody saved? When's the last time? So humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn off their wicked TVs. Or no, uh, turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Folks, America needs to be healed. We've got serious problems. God gave us the solution, and we're not doing it. I don't see it. Preacher, do you see it? I think we're going to get what we deserve. <laughs> we're just going to get it. Little David was sent off to help his brothers. You know, they were fighting the war over there. Little David came up to the battle and gave him some cheese and raisins and stuff, and he saw Goliath out there. And David said, hey, why don't you one of you guys go beat him up? And his oldest brother said, hey, go home and take care of the sheep, man, you little punk. Get out of here. And David said, is there not a cause? <clears throat> wow, what a verse. Is there not a cause? Hey, what's your cause? I don't know what happened to me, brother, but about 14 years ago, I just got bit with this bug that this is the greatest cause there is. Preaching the gospel, winning folks, and evolution is the greatest obstacle, so let's just tackle it head on. Let's chop right at the root of the tree. Evolution is the philosophy behind all sorts of evil things going on. Let's just go right for the root. What cause do you live for? Is this it? Sports. Oh, wow, he can throw the ball through the hoop. Ooh, wow. Who's going to care in a thousand years? Does anybody know who won the Super Bowl 10 years ago? Does anybody care? Doesn't matter. All those grown men out there fighting over that one ball, they can all afford to go buy their own. <laughs> it's not sinful, it's just stupid. You pay a guy $5 million to carry a pig bladder down a cow pasture. I mean, come on. <laughs> Get all them big lugs out of the way and I'll carry it down there for you. you know? <laughs> We've gone nuts. The Bible says, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver. The people that have millions of dollars, do you know what they want? More. The people that have 50 pairs of shoes in their closet, you know what they want? More shoes. The people that have a big house, you know what they want? Bigger house. The people that have a fast car, you know what they want? Faster. I guess, yeah, true. <laughs> It takes us a whole lifetime to figure out things in this world do not satisfy. People that play golf, you know, five hours a week, you know what they want? Oh, six hours a week. Seven, eight, nine. Hey, did you know if you spend thousands of hours practicing at golf, get the grip just right, you know, shoulders curled, this thumb and finger make a V, point it toward this shoulder, same thing over here, knee slightly bent, shoulders curled, club face perpendicular to the ball, bend the right elbow first. If you practice for thousands of hours, someday you will be able to knock a ball into a hole in the dirt. <laughs> and the angels rejoiced. Oh. <laughs> we have gone nuts. The Bible says, seek those things which are above. Set your affection on things above. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. It's not of the Father, it's of the world. And the world passeth away. I remember when I was working at General Motors, working my way through college. Every night we'd put together 250 some trucks. Assembly line, you know, come by, put, do my thing. Another one comes by and we do my thing to the truck. And I thought, you know, everything I'm doing here is going to burn. It's all going to burn. When we were working at M&A together, brother building cabinets, we worked hard, had a good job, but I said, you know, this is all going to burn. It's all going to burn. I want to invest my life in something that's going to last forever. Get our videotape on how to make money and spend it God's way. See the way you really ought to spend your money. Number 10, listen for the trumpet. The Bible says, The Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of God, the, trump of the, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Southern Baptists, go first. But hey, we're going next, okay? And then... I pick on the Southern Baptists a lot. I, I, used, I speak in a lot of their churches, too, and I'm Baptist myself. Uh, we're going to be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Listen for the trumpet, folks. It's coming soon. Number 11, win souls. The last mention of Caesar, 
is right here. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. You say, oh, they're going to send troops in and can occupy America. Oh, good, go witness to them. Amen. They sent troops in to occupy Israel, didn't they? What did the disciples do? Led them to Christ. I don't think the disciples sat around worrying about, oh, did you know the Romans are going to send another thousand troops to Bethlehem? Oh, really? Hey, get some more tracks, guys. Let's go. That's got to be the attitude we take. He that winneth souls is wise. During a civil war, this big old country boy from Alabama signed up to go fight the war. Man, he's sick of them Yankees down here invading our territory, you know, so he got him a rifle, got him a backpack, and went off and joined the army. He showed up for battle said, reporting for duty, sir. Sergeant said, son, we're glad you're here. Man, we need recruits bad. He said, son, your job is to guard this trench right here. Soldier said, Sarge, I didn't come to guard no trench. I come to fight Yanks, and they're right over there. Can I go fight them? He said, no, son, you don't understand. We're dug in, they're dug in, and we're waiting for orders. Guard the trench right here. So the old country boy started marching back and forth in the mud. You know, he's getting madder by the minute. He said, man, I didn't come here to march in the mud. I come to fight Yanks, and they're right over there. Why can't I go fight them? <laughs> Finally, he worked himself up into a frenzy. He dropped everything jumped up out of the trench and ran screaming and yelling across no man's land straight for the Yankee trench. A one-man rebel charge. The Yanks were stunned. They thought, wow, this guy's trying to commit suicide. He ran all the way across no man's land, jumped into the Yankee trench, picked up the first Yankee he saw, and kaboom, knocked him out. One punch. He was a country boy. He'd been toting hay, you know. Kaboom, <laughs> knocked him out. Grabbed his prisoner, climbed up out of the trench, and ran back for the rebel trench. Nobody dared shoot now. He jumped into the rebel trench and all the rebs gathered around and said, What's that? He said, That's a Yankee. They said, Well, where'd you get him? He said, I got him over yonder. He said, Y'all could have had one if and you'd have wanted one. <laughs> There's a whole bunch more over there. Hey, you know what? I think one of these days we're going to get to heaven and some people are going to have a crowd gathered around them that they influenced for God. Some of you Sunday school teachers have been faithful for years, and you've influenced thousands of people over time. You don't even know about some of them. Amen. And you're going to have a crowd of people gathered around you. And somebody else is going to walk up and say, where'd you get all them? you say, well, I got them down yonder on the earth. Y'all could have had one if and yet have wanted one. What do you want? you want to win somebody to the Lord? Or do you want to find out who throws the ball through the hoop? It just the longer I live, the less some of those things matter to me. When I was 16 years old, I gave my heart to the Lord, got saved, started going to independent, temperamental, fundamental, right-wing, radical, chicken-eating, Baptist church. <laughs> started reading my Bible, growing in the Lord. Boy, it was great. After about two or three months, a friend of mine said, Hey, Kent, let's go to the Heart of Illinois Fair. They've got a fair going on there, carnival, you know. And your, Our job is from, as this uh, Christian organization is to try to get all these people saved at the fair. I said, I don't know how to get anybody saved. They said, well, don't worry about it. Just come with us. All you got to do is go out and do a survey in the crowd. Ask them a question. Would you like to get to know God better? If they say yes, you bring them to us, and we'll show them how to get saved. I said, great. First night, I went out there, and I'm bringing folks back to the back of the tent, introducing them to the soul winner. I thought, this, this is good, man. This is fun. Third night, I believe, I'm out there talking to this big old football player, and I said, hey, would you like to get to know God better? He said, yeah, I would. I said, Come with me. We went to the back of the tent. I opened up the tent flap, and there was nobody there. I later found out they had been down at the circus, you know. They'd been down talking to the Siamese twins and led one of them to Christ. <laughs> so the next night, they went down there to disciple them, and they started talking about, you know, one of these days the Lord's going to come, and all the Christians are going to be taken out of here. And, of course, his brother's sitting right there. Hey, what's going to happen to me? Oh, you're going to have a problem, aren't you? <laughs> so he ended up getting saved, too. I didn't know that all at the time. All I knew was, I'm standing here with this big football player, and there's nobody in the back. He said, what do we do now? I said, well, uh, I guess I'll show you. I was a brand-new Christian, never showed anybody how to get saved in my life. I reached in my pocket and had a track, God's Four Spiritual Laws, one we used to use back then. We sat down in the chairs there in the dirt floor in the heart of Illinois Fair in the tent. And I read the whole tract to him. I said, well, law one, you're a sinner. You deserve to go to hell. You know, Christ died for you. Went through the whole plan of salvation with God's four spiritual laws. At the end, I had a prayer to pray. 
said, would you like to receive Christ? You prayed this prayer. He said, yeah, I'd like to receive Christ. I said, oh, brother, I got him on the hook and I can't land him. You know, what do I do now? I said, well, it says pray this prayer, so let's pray. We bowed our heads, closed our eyes. I kept one eye open, and I read the prayer off that track. I didn't know what else to do. <laughs> I read the prayer to him. And he prayed and invited Christ to forgive his sins and save his soul that night. He stood up and he looked at me and said, Kent, I've been worried about this for two weeks now. Thanks so much for showing me. I said, you're welcome. First person I led to Christ. He walked out of the tent. Boy, it was a noisy carnival, no, you know, just a mess outside. I just got down on my knees by that metal chair and that dirt floor in the middle of that tent, all the hollering and yelling outside. I said, Lord, uh, it's me. It's Kent. I said, Lord, I've just been saved for a couple of months here. This is all new to me. I'm kind of confused. I said, I don't know what you want me to do with my life. But Lord, if it's okay with you, uh, I think I'd like to do this the rest of my life. I just want to bring people to Jesus. I don't know what's important to you. I don't know. But I tell you what drives me. I want to win souls. I want to influence others for Christ. I want to do this the rest of my life. People say, Brother Hovind, you travel so much. Oh, I know. Man, flew 175 times last year. Spoke nearly 800 times. Going to try to do more this year. They say, well, if you burn the candle at both ends, you know. Oh, yeah, I know. You get twice the light. I know. <laughs> Number 12. I re read the last chapter, folks. We win. Amen. Satan thinks he's going to set up his new world order. Don't worry about it. Christ is going to set up his new world order. We're going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. The Bible says, The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. He saw an angel come down from heaven having a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. He shut him up. They would deceive the nations no more. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. That might be us, folks. We may have to get beheaded. Oh, well. Some people don't use theirs anyway. Wouldn't miss it. Right? <laughs> we're going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Then we're going to see Satan cast into the lake of fire forever. You choose which side you want to be on. I choose the winning side. Amen. The Spirit and the bride say, come. Let him that heareth say, come. Let him that is a thirst, come. Come. Come to the Lord. If you're not saved, come to the Lord and let him forgive your sins. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. If we can be any help, our ministry exists to help strengthen your faith in the Word of God. Or, if you're not a Christian, we want to get you saved. Amen. That's what we're here for. Give us a call. You can get one of our catalogs. Our material is not copyrighted purposely. Come down and see our bookstore if you're in Pensacola, or get one of our videotapes if you're not, or come see our Dinosaur Adventure Land. Man, you want to have a fun time. We're having a blast. We don't really have a plan. Someday we'd like to sell the lawnmower once everything gets covered with buildings, you know, but basically that's the plan. <laughs> we just want to influence people for the Lord. Find something to do. Hey, if you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, it's so simple. You and I are sinners. We deserve to die and go straight to hell for our sin, according to Romans 3.23. If God sent us to hell tonight, it would be exactly what we deserve. But, in spite of the fact that God's angry with the wicked every day, He loves you and He wants you to come to heaven. But He's not going to bring you like you are. You've got to come through Christ or you're not coming. So February 9, 1969, a friend of mine said, Kent, you're a sinner. I said, oh, I know that. He said, you deserve to go to hell. I said, yep, I know that too. He said, but Jesus died in your place. That's why he died on the cross, to pay for your sin. And if you'd like to receive him as your Savior right now, you can take him and he'll take you. I thought, wow, what a deal. I bowed my head and I said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I deserve to go to hell, but I want you to forgive me and save me right now. And on that day, I accepted Christ as my Savior. You could do the same thing. There's no magic words. Just get off by yourself and just say something like, Lord, would you please forgive me? God, be merciful to me. I deserve to go to hell. Forgive me and save me. And then write this date down in your Bible because this is your spiritual birthday. The Bible says, As many as receive him, John 1, 12, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. John 3 says, You must be born again to go to heaven. Well, that's how you get born again. 
As soon as you receive Christ, poof, you're born again. Now you're one of God's kids. Which means He won't send you to hell. He might take you to heaven early if you don't straighten up, you know, but He won't, he won't send you to hell. See, some of God's kids, He takes them home and crowns them. Others, He crowns them and takes them home. That's your choice, okay? <laughs> but uh, well, once my kids got into my family, I was stuck with them. Once you get into God's family, you're, you're stuck, okay? Now, that doesn't mean, you know, you won't get by with things. He may judge you. There's a sin unto death. You know, you can commit sins as a Christian and God will kill you. But He won't send you to hell. He gave you eternal life, not temporary life. We'll cover all that some other time. If we can be any help, please give us a call. Our phone number and address and website and stuff will come up on the, scene, on the uh, uh, screen here. We want to help strengthen your faith. In video tape number six, we're going to talk about the flood when God judged this world. What caused the flood in the days of Noah? Then on tape seven, we go through th over three hours of questions and answers. Things like, where do the races come from? What about carbon dating? What about starlight? How did the, all, we got 60 some questions we try to answer on there on videotape number seven. We want to help try to answer questions, set the record straight. God's word is true. And if you're not saved, you're going to hell, whether you believe it or not. But you can be forgiven and go to heaven if you'll accept Christ as your savior. Thank you so much.